Great, thank you. We'll call the meeting to order. This is the October 2nd meeting of the Yellow Springs Village Council. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes, Wintrow. Here. Tausch. Here. Sims. Here. McQueen. Here. Hempfling. Here. Also present are Village Manager Patty Bates, Assistant Village Manager Melissa Dodd, and Village Solicitor Chris Conard. Great, welcome everyone. It's large vast audience watching, <laughs> sitting in council chambers with us. Um, we've been lonely lately, folks at home. Um, announcements. Anybody have announcements? Yes. Okay. So quickly. Uh, yeah, I'd like to announce, you know, that we have two conferences and workshops coming up this month. It's a big month. So, um, this uh, on October 20th and 21st is the Economics of Happiness Conference, sponsored by uh, Community Solutions. And you know, you don't necessarily think of economics along with happiness. <laughs> um, but so that's a good reason to go. And I, you know, I think that in Yellow Springs, sometimes we get. Um, sort of polarized about about economy and people's concerns about uh, development um, because of concerns about global capitalism, for one thing. Uh, this this conference is looking at what, what kind of uh, economy do we need for human scale and for environmental sustainability. And they have some very cool uh, presenters uh, coming at the conference. So it's October 20th and 21st. It'll be happen in Antioch Midwest. Um, you probably can't see that from there. Um, but um, there are flyers outside uh, on the table and I'll put them downstairs in the downstairs lobby. Uh, there are some scholarships available and I encourage people to check this out. And I know Marianne was also referring as a second conference, uh, the Restorative Justice Conference that's going to be happening at the end of the month. And I wanted to add uh, to make sure that everybody uh, remembers that October 12th is the conference on dementia that's part of the Yellow Springs Senior Center's initiative towards a dementia-friendly Yellow Springs. Um, and so you can get more information about that at the Senior Center. My other announcement, I wanted to make sure everybody knows that Wednesday, October 4th is International Walk to School Day. And we always celebrate walking and biking to school in Yellow Springs. And um, uh, I was actually on the Bulldog News this morning and uh, I was just kind of looking up something and I found uh, there is a challenge to elected officials uh, and it's at the website Walk Bike to school.org and uh, you make two commitments. One is that you attend the walk to school uh, day event. Everyone here is welcome to do that. And secondly is committing to uh, Vision Zero, which is all about um, the safety initiative to have no fatalities related to uh, cars hitting pedestrians or bicyclists. Um, so I thought that was a really cool thing and uh, I encourage everybody to sign on and come on Wednesday. What time? Nine o'clock at Mills Lawn. I have one other announcement. Um, I don't know if um, there are any organizations or the schools are celebrating this, but last year uh, the Human Relations Commission uh, recommended that we change Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. It's not a holiday that gets celebrated in terms of uh, village taking the day off. But um, it is an important holiday, and that is next Monday on the 9th. Great. Thanks. I've got a few. Um, tomorrow night at 5.30 is a great event. Um, it's called Books and Beer. It's at Yellow Springs Brewery, and it's uh, from uh, Green County Library Foundation, and it's to support the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. And that's a project that um, puts a book in the hands of every child. We're trying to put a book in the hands of every child in Greene County, five and under, every month, a new book every month. So if your child um, signs up for this, they automatically get a book free every month um, until they're five. So it's a really great program. 
Um, it's a very inexpensive evening. There's some great uh, silent auction gifts and, and prizes, so please come on out at 5.30 at Yellow Springs Brewery. Um, Street Fair is October 14th. Um, and then the following weekend is um, a relatively new event. Last year was the first year we had it. It's called Yellow Springs Open Studios. It's October 21st and 22nd. And it's uh, 22 studios uh, with 30 artists participating. And the studios, a lot of them are local, right in Yellow Springs, mm -hmm. and uh, at about a five mile radius of Yellow Springs. Um, so it's, it's always a really, really nice event. When is that? Uh, the 21st, October 21st and 22nd. I do have one announcement. Um, either starting late tomorrow or early on Wednesday, um, they should be in the village paving all of the streets that they milled last week in preparation for the paving. So um, it will be either late tomorrow or early Wednesday, depending on when they finish up in Xenia with that, the paving equipment and get down here. Okay. And, and I have two quick ones. Um, you know, we were living in a somewhat troubling society and just want everybody to remember those from last evening that uh, unfortunately uh, found themselves in a tragic situation and that we send out our blessings and hope for a speedy recovery. And, and number two, uh, let us not forget the people in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. and the other Virgin Islands, you know, yeah. they are really suffering. Uh, it seems like it's kind of difficult for us to get supplies and so forth to them for what they need. But again, remember those folks because it, it could happen to us. So, and, and we are all Americans. So, uh, hopefully, they'll fare it a little bit better than they have so far. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, next is the consent agenda. We have the minutes of September 18th and uh, resolution 2017-46, authorizing the village manager to enter into a five-month contract with Dental Care Plus for dental insurance for village employees. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Um, review of the agenda. Is there anything we want to add or move around on the agenda? Um, I had requested that we move the housing needs assessment update to old business. Okay. From the manager's report. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, Brian, would you review the petitions and communications, please? Uh, yeah, we just had one. It was from Greene County Public Health, and it was uh, highlighting their food safety uh, training courses. So uh, if you wanted more information about that, uh, please contact uh, the public health offices. Thank you. And, well, and I wanted to um, just update on the non... Uh, we, uh, Brian and I have made contacts with some... Uh, people in the community, organizations, churches, um, regarding the idea of a community-wide nonviolent training in just so that the village is prepared should um, we have uh, the unfortunate situation of uh, white supremacists wanting to come to the village and that we would be able to respond to that community-wide in a unified way. Um, so we're organizing a meeting. Uh, Brian and I are just bringing some people together to, um, I mean, the Quaker meeting has expressed interest um, in bringing a trainer to town. And so, and we wanted to talk to the chief, have the chief be a part of this discussion. Um, so anyway, we're moving forward with that. We're hoping to have a meeting next week. Okay, thank you. Um, first, uh, public moving on to public hearings and legislation. Uh, we'll do these by title only. I wonder if we should do the tobacco one. Oh, no, not. We should not read that whole thing. Um, let's do it by title only, Judy. Certainly. This is Ordinance 2017 limiting smoking and the use of other tobacco products on village owned properties to designated areas. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. So, who's going to explain? I will. Okay. 
Um, if you recall, uh, quite some time ago, Shernaz, a reporter who is with us this evening in the audience, um, came to council with some information on uh, creating a no smoking uh, on public property ordinance in the village. And after some discussion, council asked me to move forward with a an ordinance that limited smoking on um, properties owned by the village, um, oh, except when those properties are too small to uh, house a designated smoking area, and then there is no smoking on those properties. So on properties like the Bryan Center here, uh, staff will create a designated smoking area, and uh, people will be directed to that area if they want to smoke, um, so that we get them away from the doors and away from the playground equipment. and the spaces where other people are frequent, you know, frequently passing through or congregating. Um, so this ban takes effect, or this limitation takes effect the first of the year, which gives staff enough time to designate those areas and create some kind of a small structure for folks to, to have a place to smoke if they are smokers. Um, Shernaz, would you like to say anything else? Just like to commend the council on making the Can you come up? Because I have a couple. <laughs> I just want to thank and commend the council for making the decision to go ahead with this legislation. It is a public health issue, and tobacco kills more people. Then heroin overdoses, car accidents all combine, almost half a million people a year. I know a lot of people feel it's an infringement on their rights, but it's not a protected right. And so, this is a public health critical issue and it impacts people that are harmed the most economically and physically, people with mental health and disability issues too. So I want to thank you so much and um, support you in any way in the future with this legislation. And that, I'm sorry, and the health district is purchasing uh, the signs for us that, that we can put up that's that, and I, I'm sorry I did not put the, the rendering you gave me in the packet, but um, it is a grant that they have to do this, and so they are purchasing the signs for us. I, I, that's part of what I was going to ask was the support services that might be available. Do you have printed materials that we could have access to also? I have general cessation material. Um, if you want me to create something and you have some suggestions, I would be happy to do that. Do you have classes available, or can you direct people to classes if that ever... We, right now we have a cessation program that's going to occur in Xenia. We're kind of targeting some folks um, because metropolitan housing is going completely smoke free um, in April of 2018. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we're starting to work with some of those populations and we have quite a few housing, multi-unit housing complexes in Yellow Springs. So they will be getting that in the mail from Green Metropolitan Housing. We also will be working with Job and Family Services to reach out to some of that population. And in general, many people through the Affordable Care Act, their insurance should pay for them to get cessation services. Mm -hmm. um, so I do <coughs> recommend that people contact their health care provider and request that and call their insurance because they can get cessation chantix patches, that type of thing. We're going to be providing cessation for sessions starting the 20... I'll have it, 23rd of October, four sessions at Green County Public Library in Xenia. So I can get that information to you also if people want to register, that would, that'd be great. And I just want to be sure that, that we're getting the word out. And I, it's something I, I told staff. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, we've got a busy month, month and a half right now with the, with the election coming up. So I'm sure that that's going to dominate the newspaper. But maybe after, um, you could write a letter to the editor as as the Green County Health Rep or sure. something that, that to let people know, to give people some um, advice. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. And isn't there, ever, doesn't every state have a 1-800 number? 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Yeah. And we can get that information. I could even put it on the signage if we, if we could fit it on there. Yeah. If you want it on the signage, it's up to you. Yeah. I wouldn't mind something that, that yeah. gives people a next step. Whatever, if it's <coughs> your website, if it's something, mm -hmm. I wouldn't mind there being yeah. So what is, what is on the signage currently? It, 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 it talk, basic. talks about healthy lungs. It has our, lo our Village of Yellow Springs logo on it. It has the Green County Health District logo on it. I believe it has a child playing. 
just a child swinging, but we could try to fit the 1-800-QUIT-NOW logo on there uh -huh. so people could call to get information about quitting. Okay. And some of our local hospitals, I know uh, Kettering Health Network has some cessation and so does Premier Health, so people that go to those providers can request that through those organizations. But we will also be doing some more cessation. There's only like one person in the whole county doing it and I'm getting some help with another organization, but I'm doing two full-time grants, so we're trying to s kind of squeeze the cessation in. Mm -hmm. It's kind of logistics are hard. Well, I do have an idea related to literature mm -hmm. um, that we could collaborate on, which is um, getting a clear message out, and a lot of it, I think, is embodied in this resolution um, about some of these statistics that I don't think people are aware of, and tying that to the reason why the village is making this a policy. I don't know if that could go in utility bills or something like that, but I'd like to collaborate Definitely. on something like that. Um, and also, Shanaz, can you tell us what, what is the status sort of countywide with these kinds of um, policies? Beaver Creek uh, Parks and Recreation and Culture has gotten the signage. Wilberforce University has recently, recently gone tobacco-free. Wright State University went tobacco-free in July. We will be approaching other um, cities and, and villages. Uh, we've had discussions with Xenia mm -hmm. and the city um, manager is very interested and we're waiting to hear what they're saying. We'll be approaching also Fairborn, Bellbrook and other and eventually we'd like to go to the county commissioners and get some input with them because they cover the, the county parks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think people forget that cigarette butts are trash and they're very toxic and they're dropped as litter every day and it's litter and it's not and you know you can't enforce every cigarette butt and you can't give a fine for every cigarette butt but people forget and I see them toss them all the time I see them around town I see them all over the county and so go to Green County Parks start with Green County Parks I think they would be very supportive and mm -hmm. Chris Bell does well with the commissioner so if you get Chris Bell on your side that would help great I, I wonder if we could get a, uh, a little uh, plastic I don't know, holder that would hold some little rack uh, cards yeah that yeah. could be covered and that could be there's yeah. it can be kind of it, it well, might be something we could put on the pole right we can make that happen with one of those perhaps one of those uh, Things like they, you put in front of your house to, if you were selling your house, right. you know, the information in it or something. I mean, I think this, the information, particularly about uh, children, yeah. the impacts on children, the you know eating discarded butts, um, and the secondhand so, and smoke, our, in, mm -hmm. and the since we're doing this in the parks, you know that's seems like an important focus. Yeah, sure does. If you want to provide me with just a bullet point thing, I can have that in the next packet with information about services and. Where to go. And are we going to be providing some sort of waste receptacle yes. okay. at the designated smoking areas? Yes. Okay, good. And something else to consider, which is a movement that's occurring around the country, is Tobacco 21 legislation, which is creating ordinances where you have to be 21 years of age to purchase tobacco products. The tobacco industry spends about $9 billion a year advertising, costs about five cents to make a pack of cigarettes. If you go to your local stores, you know that they pay dearly for that whole bank behind the cash register in Yellow Springs. We have right across from our elementary school two establishments which sell tobacco products right in the path from the library. Kids are walking past there and they're seeing that every day when they go in to get their snacks, their drinks on a regular basis. We also have one of the businesses uses an animal to advertise their wares and we don't want kids to be influenced. The, the thing is if people don't start and they don't start before 21, they're more likely to not start at all. So just is, does local, juris, do local jurisdictions have any control or is that a state or? That's local jurisdictions. The city of Columbus has already um, done that legislation and so has Cleveland. A lot of cities around the nation are you. You can make that decision at any time that you have to be 21 to purchase in the village of Yellow Springs. And also what you can do is with licenses to 
what we're looking into also is maybe having licensing where if you sell tobacco you're you have to, you can only have so many tobacco sales locations within a certain district mm -hmm. around a school mm -hmm. we want to keep it away from kids we don't want kids to start and tobacco companies are notorious for targeting kids people with lower income people with lower end levels of education people with mental health and substance abuse issues so this is i mean this is a whole a whole other right. no, discussion I let's but, but i am interested um it would probably be something i wouldn't be involved in deciding but i would i although i would be concerned from the business standpoint of what the potential impact on our businesses so only a two percent change in sales okay <laughs> is the is what is already been looked at but the benefits long term that saved in health for a family are millions of are hundreds of millions of dollars over for large families i had one woman she added up the amount of money her family spent on tobacco grandparents smoking aunts and uncles smoking it was a relatively large family in a 25 year period they spent nine hundred thousand dollars on smoking and so it's about health we pride ourselves, I think, in this town on being an education village, being progressive, caring about people, caring about health, and not to tell people how to live their life, but cigarette smoking causes a lot of damage to a lot of people. And right now it's hurting the, the people that can't afford it the most. So, so, so currently how old do you have to be? 18? 18. 18 years. Uh, I would like to pursue that. I think I told her that. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So well, I, I agree. <laughs> we, we can Sorry. follow up on the um, materials for the packets, um, for the mailings, and also maybe change the sign, have the, the quit line on there, mention on the sign, I, maybe a small... Can we see the sign? I, yeah, I'm I'd a like designer. I'm sorry. I like to... Yeah. No, I sent it to Patty, yeah. so I thought she would have kind of gotten approval. You yeah. know, I didn't know. She's, it's, it's, a, it's just a basic... Yeah, I would it's like a basic sign. sign. We can add, change, adjust, anything okay. you want to do. Is this coming would back at the next please meeting? Please turn their phones off. Thank you. Is this coming back at our next meeting? Yeah, yeah so maybe we can have that information. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Um, I think we need to take the vote. Judy? Oh, yeah. we need to do that. Yes. House. Yes. Sims? Yes. Hempling? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Wintrow? Yes. Next is 2017-28. This is, and I will explain it after I read in the title, this is amending the official zoning map of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, for the property located on High Street, parcel ID number F19-0001-00010-0083-0042-0043-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0044-0
And so the first one that we're talking about tonight is the uh, sewer connection fee. Um, it is a straight $750 all the way up to an eight inch main, uh, and then it does increase. A sewer connection fee, uh, it requires three visits, three site visits from staff. Um, it also, uh, part of this fee pays for the capacity that we maintain at the plant. And um, also we hope to start doing some sewer relining uh, to lower the infill and uh, infiltration and inflow that um, the rainwater that gets uh, from the ground into the pipes and increases the volume that we treat at the plants. And just to reiterate, there's no material cost? Correct. There are no material costs on sewer tap fees. Okay. Any other comments or questions from council? Um, I just want to make sure that the formatting is going to be corrected in the whatever goes into the ordinance, I guess. With the strike throughs? Yeah, it's taken just, out. Yeah, I it's think just what we got in the packet is all the columns aren't matched up and... Chris is nodding, so I'm assuming okay. he will. It's just a little bit confusing to read. Okay, yeah. cool. I just wanted to say this has to, just in case the public isn't understanding what the tap-in fees are, this is when something new is being is being hooked into the sewer system. Correct. This is a fee. Yeah. Correct. All, all of these uh, tap fees are when when someone uh, a new makes a new connection for that utility into our system, whether it be water, sewer, or electric. They're all for new connections. And when's the last time? Do we know the last time these were? Increased. I think it's been 12 years, okay. um, but it's been so long since we started looking at them that I've forgotten. Okay. Um, and you, the village did do, staff did do a comparative analysis of some other communities in the area and some comparably sized communities, and these seem to fall. Um, they were kind of all across the board, actually, mm -hmm. but these seem to fall at about an average um, place. Um, so any comments or questions from citizens? There will be two readings, so we'll, we'll do the final reading at the next meeting. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Housh? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Sims? Yes. Hempling? Yes. Wintrow? Yes. Okay, we're on to uh, Ordinance 2017-30. This is repealing Section 1046.01 connection fees of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1046.01 connection fees, water. Thank you. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, this, uh, this is for water, and water does reflect some material costs. Um, what we charge right now does not even recoup the material costs of what we put into the, um, into the meter. Um, most people have a th uh, three quarter by three quarter meter, and that will go from 375 to 600. Um, this does increase uh, depending upon the size of the meter because the larger you go, the more the meter costs. And that's why when we get up to a certain point of a three inch meter, you see materials plus, it says plus cost, which is our cost to install it. If we do not install it, we don't charge any of that aid to construction. And it's straight materials, it's whatever we pay for the meter and the connectors. And the fact that nothing changed on the five eights is that indicating that there will be no more uh, no, there be no more installed at correct. that size. Okay. No more five eight by three quarter. Mm. Any other comments or questions from council? Comments or questions from citizens? Judy, please call the roll. McQueen, yes. Hempling, yes. Housh, yes. Sims, yes. Wintrow, yes. One last utility to deal with. Mm -hmm. This is repealing section 1042.02 special provisions related to electric service of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new section 1042.02 special provisions related to electric service. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Uh, thank you. Patty? We do not currently charge anything for an electric tap. 
We provide the meter, but we do not charge anything for any of the materials. So from now on, a residential uh, electric tap will be $250, and the cost of a commercial connection will be the cost of the materials, and the village will then again determine if the aid to construction is necessary or if a private contractor can install that particular electric meter based upon the situation. And that's why the wording is a little bit different in this um, ordinance than it is in the other two. Okay. Any comments or questions from council? Citizens, Judy, please call the roll. Housh? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Sims? Yes. Empling? Yes. Winter? Yes. Okay, we're done with legislation. Now is the time in the agenda when we hear from citizens about um, items that are not on the agenda. We ask that you um, come to the podium and state your name and you have three minutes to speak. Good evening, Council, fellow villagers. My name is Ms. Shia Fields, founder of Ms. Shia's Kids Club, and I'm having a peace rally at Gone Park the 21st of October, and I came out this evening to invite everybody to come. Thank you. Vendors are welcome, musicians, artists, poets are, are welcome and needed. Um, it's a day of freedom. Uh, getting together, having a good old shindig. Me and my kids club will be bringing this to you. Lucked up on some cheap insurance. I'm just blessed. Coming and going, I'm blessed. But I just wanted to uh, invite you all out. That's the 21st of October, the week after street fair. And just come out and have a good time with me. You have any questions? Mm -hmm. Nope. Thank okay, you. sounds great. Thanks. Okay, with those few words, I'll yield the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Shia. <laughs> Anyone else? I think everybody else is here with a purpose. Dave, you're the only one that's not here with a purpose. <laughs> <laughs> or at least I'm sh that you're not on the agenda. Oh, yes, you are, because you're Justice System Task Force, aren't you? Yeah, I want to whine about something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> writing this letter to, buy it to the editor in the head and I thought, oh, I can say it here to you guys. And when the Vandals for Jesus came and put repent signs up downtown a few years ago, it was annoying. But that's just somebody shoving their religious views down my throat and I can ignore that. But when the people painted out my street signs, then, you know, now people are finding it harder to find my house. And if you change the names of the streets, which I was reading about in the paper as a suggestion the other day, I've got to, and everybody else has to send out change of address notices for driver's license and tax returns and publications and all kinds of things. And the post office has got to print labels. I'd rather you not deal with the thing that way. You know, maybe some uh, hidden cameras and lasers would be good, but you know, I also would find it annoying to respond by, you know, to some misguided act by somebody who's just crabby, I suspect, by doing something like that. So I'd like you to consider that when you're thinking about, you know, changing the, changing the name of my street. I don't want to be too whiny, but I'll be whiny at this point. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Is, is now a time to address what the, the high school is doing about that? Or, well, well, I guess, and then maybe Patty can share her piece of information. Okay. Um, I talked to Kevin Lighty uh, <laughs> at the high school about this particular issue of graffiti on uh, on Whiteman Street, and he uh, said that his one of his classes is had been working on a project with the Glen because there's been graffiti in the Glen, and they're having a meeting tomorrow afternoon. I'll go to that meeting to talk about what they've come up with. So I I talked to Kevin about this particular issue, and. Um, see what the high school kids have in mind on how to deal with this situation. Mm -hmm. And Brian had asked me to double check on the cost of the signs um, each time they're spray painted, which has happened twice now. And if you do both the East and West Whiteman signs, there's a total of six signs. It costs about $250, a little more than $250 every time uh, those are painted all over. And the um, stop signs that are getting graffitied, which I think she said might be a different issue, but those are $44.30 a piece. And you're just giving material costs, and right? And that is just the material costs. It's roughly um, for the crews to install those or take those down and 
put new ones up or sometimes take the signpost out if necessary. Um, it's about $60 an hour for them to do all of that. So if they're just changing the signs, it's about $60 an hour. And so depending on how many you can get down in an hour and, mm -hmm. and back up. And I just want to reiterate, I've already had two people that could not find my house because they, I didn't tell them to look for the blackout sign. Um, but I, I do want to emphasize that uh, I think it might have been easy to misread what we talked about at the last meeting since I brought this up. What I emphasized was that there is a financial issue here that we need to address. Um, that doesn't mean that I or anyone has said anything about we're going to go change that sign tomorrow or the name of the street. So, um, you know, but that we need to, you know, realistically look at the fact that this keeps on happening and it costs 350 bucks every time to change them out. Um, we need to address that. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, uh, next item on the agenda, we're moving to special reports and we have some special guests here um, <coughs> to, to do the Complete Streets presentation from Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission. Matt Lindsay and Kim Lehman. Kim Lehman from, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and these folks have been doing a, uh, a lot of work with us. Oh, are you, you're going to... He's going to do it from up here. Nice. Wow. Well, I, is that allowed? <laughs> <laughs> he is. He is a quasi-government official. <laughs> Susan can fill me in from there. Well, I, I thank Judy for uh, her offer of letting me control the computer, even though it uh, kicked her out of her own seat. My name is Matt Lindsay. I'm with the Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission. Uh, a Voluntary Association of Member Governments uh, that does planning on transportation, environmental, land use issues across the Miami Valley. Um, uh, Village of Yellow Springs is one of our member jurisdictions, one of our 74 member jurisdictions, and we very much appreciate the support of the, the village uh, for our regional mission. I'm in the uh, Sustainable Solutions and Transportation Alternatives Department, which looks at ways of encouraging members of the Miami Valley, citizens of the Miami Valley to choose alternative modes of transportation, non-motorized modes, um, uh, biking, walking, carpooling, using transit. Um, and we also, at the same time, encourage our member jurisdictions to develop in ways that make that choice easier for their residents. And uh, we had the um, privilege, the honor of uh, preventing, presenting a Complete Streets workshop for uh, citizens and some of the members of the council uh, here in the Bryan Center about a month ago. Mm -hmm. Is that about right? Um, and uh, this presentation is a bit of a summary of that workshop. Uh, let's see. So. Um, this question that's up on the screen now, what is a street and what is it used for, is a critical question. It's probably the question that communities thinking about adopting a complete streets approach should be thinking about. And I dare say that in the village of Yellow Springs, that answer is as unique as the village. When you uh, consider the issue of what is a complete street, uh, I, I'll go over the definition that's shown here. A complete street is safe and comfortable and convenient for travel via all modes, transporta uh, transportation modes, f automobile, foot, bicycle, mobility devices, and transit to go along and to go across that street for all users. But what is this complete streets approach? It's important to understand that uh, a complete street is an outcome a, a safe and complete street is an outcome that comes from a planning process that is driven by a local complete streets policy. Um, it's uh, the, the complete streets approach is not just simply passing a policy, but it's also embracing that policy and the uh, processes that it that it uh, that it, it that it engenders or inspires and 
uh, so that the community can be focused on the outcomes along the streets that are, are really desired. A policy helps you get there, but the outcome is uh, the result of a process. A complete streets policy will help ensure that the entire right of way, which is a publicly owned piece of property, is designed for the safe and comfortable use of all users. <coughs> And I thank many members of your council and some of you here in the audience for some of the pictures that were provided for this presentation. Uh, complete streets policies provide for all users, as we say, uh, including uh, uh, these different population groups that you're seeing here, students, um, people uh, using mobility devices, pr people proceeding, proceeding up and down the streets on wheels, including strollers and mobility devices, but there's also users of the street that are not pictured here, and that would include drivers of automobiles, emergency vehicles, freight vehicles, uh, automobiles, uh, transit vehicles, which also come through the village, uh, the green cats transit vehicles. So it's important that a complete streets policy recognize uh, the various different types of users that will be using your streets here in the village. There are a number of benefits to complete streets and they accrue across a wide spectrum from the individual to the community at large. Um, on the left side of the picture here, of the, of the diagram, we talk about some of the uh, benefits that accrue more to the individual in terms of safety, having a, a safer route throughout the city, uh, in, increased perceived safety, uh, which will lead to more walkers and bikers in your community. There's also, from the ADA compliance uh, perspective, there's uh, more paths of travel for people with disabilities and it's easier for people who will get around in strollers or get pulled in wagons, etc. People who use bark bikes. It improves uh, health by increasing the opportunities for physical activity and increases increased con connectivity throughout the village. And now we're getting towards more of the community-wide benefits. There are environmental benefits in terms of um, reduced car trips and uh, improved air quality, uh, slowing the pace of impermeable surfaces within the city uh, village is also an, a possible outcome. And then there are economic vitality outcomes that can come from more walkable and bikeable communities in terms of increased retail activity, improved uh, uh, housing values and uh, property values, uh, and it complements with economic goals of the, the land use plans of the villages. So there are a number of good reasons why uh, a village might want to consider adopting a complete streets approach. But why have a policy? It may be that you feel like your community has embraced the idea of active transportation and being friendly to bicycles and walkers, but why have a policy? And the, the important elements uh, or the important reasons for having a policy is to make sure that uh, not necessarily that you spend more on transportation projects uh, within the village, but that you spend the money perhaps differently from you have in the past. And having a policy can direct a shift in, that, in those uh, transportation priorities toward uh, making sure that projects accommodate all users and that uh, complete streets are considered through all phases of transportation projects from the design and, and planning of the projects all the way through construction, operation, and maintenance. Another reason to have complete streets policy is to ensure that the funds get used differently and that every project creates a better street right away. There are opportunistic, low-cost ways of making a, a project simply better that don't involve uh, purchasing new right away, um, but that as long as the planning, development, and review process includes considerations of all the users within the city, uh, within the village, excuse me, uh, there's an opportunity to create safer streets uh, and even safer rural roads right now for all users. Another good reason to have a complete streets policy is to give political and social community support cover to those who are going to be charged with designing the projects. To give them the understanding that the community and the leadership of the community are behind um, innovative designs that are uh, cognizant of and reflect the values of the community and that uh, 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 providing accommodation for all users is an important priority of the community. 
Uh, another way, good reason to have a complete streets policy is to create opportunities for daily physical activity and improve health outcomes. Um, when there are um, opportunities to turn, a, turn what would be a car trip into an active trip, it uh, increases physical activity for those who do that. And um, as we know, getting up even just 30 minutes a day of, of good either walking or, or biking is, is, is a key to better health outcomes. There's also a, a more technological uh, um, revolution coming in transportation about around the issues of sharing and electrification and even automation of vehicles. And in, a complete streets policy can be part of how a community makes itself ready for the, the coming um, connected and autonomous vehicle revolution that may be coming. Communities that are more walkable and more bikeable are going to be better prepared to take advantage of the sharing nature of, of transportation in the future. As more people purchase trips rather than own vehicles, serving vehicles will no longer equate to the same thing as serving people. And so if you want to make sure that your community is served by CABs and is not the other way around, uh, it's a good idea to express through policy the, the importance of uh, preserving the, uh, the ability to safely move by all modes within your community. So who wants complete streets? Well, there's lots of data out there that indicate most Americans uh, uh, would have a preference for driving less and walking more. Uh, in 2014, the American <coughs> Public Transit Association put out a study that, that showed that transit use is growing faster than population throughout the country. And there is that one-third of Americans, and it's probably the same proportion here in the village, that don't drive. They're either under 16, they don't have driving privileges yet, they're uh, lower income and can't afford to drive, or they're older residents or they have disabilities, so there are lots of needs to make sure that the all modes are accommodated. There are benefits for older Americans. The statistics here are mostly from the AARP, uh, from their, their initiative supporting complete streets as a strategy for aging in place. And uh, you can see here that there are a, a sizable portion of those over 65 who no longer drive. Um, and then there are statistics I th I th um, that indicate that uh, uh, seniors living in inhospitable areas for walking and biking do not get out and about as much as they might like. There are benefits, obvious benefits for people with disabilities. And keep in mind that we are all only temporarily abled. It's likely that everyone will, will experience a disability sometime in your lifetime, um, even if it's just in the form of a, of a, a temporary uh, injury like a broken ankle, but that can render you unable to drive and suddenly you become dependent on, on the non-driving modes of transportation for your daily activities. Accessible communities create independence for those uh, using mobility devices and a policy can also ensure that uh, uh, streets remain accessible for all even during construction projects. There are benefits for younger Americans. Millennials are driving less and looking for other transportation options. Um, and those under 16 with no driving privileges are, are all going to directly benefit from an ability to move throughout your community in a safe and convenient and uh, pleasant way. Let's keep in mind what Complete Streets is not. It is not a design prescription. It does not, a, a good policy would not mandate bike lanes or sidewalks on every street, but would rather look at context sensitive solutions that make sense for each street and its projected use and its land, its adjacent land use, etc. It's uh, not a mandate for immediate retrofit. There is no need why there, a, a good policy would not demand uh, retrofit projects, but would rather likely uh, make sure that the community capitalizes on projects as they arise to uh, gradually build a network of safe and convenient streets throughout the community for uh, all modes. And as it says here on the slide, it's not a silver bullet. There are other initiatives that must be addressed, but Complete Streets will help uh, uh, deliver on some of your um, environmental, sustainability, uh, human, human climate goals for your village. It can be part of a, an overall package. And this gets back to the whole issue of uh, not uh, 
not having a, a single prescription for your streets. Uh, one size does not fit all. Complete streets does not mean every street has to have sidewalks or bike lanes or address transit, but it's really a policy that drives a process that allows the village uh, staff and community to come together on what outcome is needed for each street as projects de uh, develop for those streets. And there are many types of complete streets. Um, outside the village, you'll see uh, good, sh perhaps good shoulders on the on the rural roads leading into the town. Neighborhood commercial uh, uh, centers with mid-block crossings or uh, raised crossings, which are uh, uh, a way of calming traffic. Uh, dedicated bike facilities on suburban-like arterials may also work well on some of the major roads inside the town. Uh, there are great ways of designing residential skinny streets. This is, a, I particularly like this picture because this street is just as wide, is plenty wide enough for two cars to pass each other, but because the way they change the pavement, it makes people think the street is narrow and it forces cars to slow down. And it's a, that's a clever design. Uh, there are also not, not as skinny residential streets here throughout the village already. I'm happy to take any questions or comments. I uh, once again thank the council for inviting us out to do the workshop and uh, look forward to assisting the council in any way, it, you know, the village, in any way it needs as the, you further consider adopting a complete streets approach. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Thank Chris, were you going to talk about uh, active transportation? If you'd like me to. I'm Committee? Yeah. <coughs> talk about some of the work that's going on there. Yes, thank you. I'm Chris Bongiorno, and I am here on behalf of the Yellow Springs Active Transportation Committee. I want to start by saying thank you to Matt and Kim, both for tonight's presentation and for the great workshop that they put together on August 24th. Um, several council members were there, village manager's office was there, police department was there, and a number of community members from across different mobility groups were in attendance, and I think we all found the workshop very helpful. Um, I also want to thank council and the manager's office for being leaders in active transportation and in complete streets in my time here, which has been about four years, I've had a pleasure working with each of you on several projects. And um, your leadership has felt, for example, in the fact that council listed as one of their priorities this year to explore creation of a complete streets policy. So I commend you for that. Um, just to echo some of what Matt said in his presentation, I think you know, what I hear from some people is, including my children, Yellow Springs is already great. What do we need to do? Well, I think we can set the bar a bit higher than we already are. It's really all about safety, and it's about considering the needs of all users right up front. Um, and I think in the long term, uh, that will help us have more uh, proactive solutions, more progressive and sustainable solutions to all of our capital projects. Instead of doing a project that involves just uh, the electric grid or just the sewer system or just uh, a surface street condition, uh, we can address, we can consider all those things at the same time when we have a true complete streets approach. So I think that in the long term, it, it leads to a more sustainable and ultimately affordable solutions to our capital projects. Um, and I wanted to just ask for clarification to our friends from NVRPC. If the village has a complete streets policy and abides by complete streets, um, the complete streets approach, it makes us more competitive when we're pursuing federal and state money for capital projects. And I'm asking that as a question. <laughs> yep. It could. It could. <laughs> it doesn't hurt. It does not hurt at all. Um, it's not a requirement to apply for a specifically an MVRPC controlled uh, pot of funds. But uh, when you apply for ours, you're, you're going to have to comply with the regional complete streets policy of MVRPC anyway. So. Um, and it is a question, right? I mean, it is one of the questions on the? Yes. OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so yes, it aligns us well, I think, with the regional policy that the MVRC, MVRPC has put forward and uh, is considered a leader nationally, actually, for a regional planning commission in having a complete streets policy on the books for several years. Um, just a little bit more about what the Active Transportation is, Committee is doing, uh, working on a number of things, including, I think, Brian, you plugged the Walk to School Day this Wednesday. We do bike to school activities as well. There's a Safe Routes project that Melissa, I think, is going to talk about later in the meeting. Um, so we're helping support all of those things. 
Um, and then we're also going to help support an, up, an upcoming active transportation plan, which we're doing in coordination with ODOT, Ohio Department of Health, and hopefully MVRPC will be at the table for that as well. Um, not sure exactly when we're going to start that, but it's going to be a process that involves a lot of community input, right. and we're definitely looking forward to helping lead that process. Right. Um, so, and the, yeah. the meetings we have, it's the second Monday of the month. We have them from 3.30 to 5 o'clock <coughs> at the library in the meeting room, and uh, our next meeting is October 9th. Um, we do our best to get them in the paper. Sometimes that doesn't happen. I can't promise you that <laughs> the news will get in the paper next week. Um, but the meetings are open, and we have a good um, diverse group of uh, members who re participate regularly in those meetings. So right. any questions? or Am I missing anything, Karen and Brian? You participate? No, but I did want to mention to council the active transportation grant that Chris um, Chris mentioned. First of all, thank you very much for your help in getting that You're together welcome. and submitting that um, because Chris did a great job with that. And as we mentioned at an earlier meeting, we were awarded that and we have finally been... One of seven communities <coughs> statewide. Of, yes. And um, they were waiting to uh, choose a consultant and they've now chosen Tool Design Group, I yep. believe is the name. And we need to choose a lead on that project. And I personally, my recommendation is that council ask Brian to take the lead on that because this is something that he's actively involved in, active transportation as well as complete streets. And these things are going to tie together. And I think Brian is the perfect lead and I could be the staff support person. Sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to do that. Uh, and, you know, the other piece of that is we will need to form an advisory group. Right. And um, my, my, my personal preference on that is that we, we do, uh, you know, a, a public call. Um, I mean, I imagine some of the active transportation committee members will come forward. But from what we read in the uh, proposal, it's going to be pretty aggressive. So we need an advisory group that can meet every couple weeks. Um, because they're trying to get that uh, that done in about three months uh, once we get started. So, um, did anybody have any questions? I, I'm actually I would like I think it makes sense for Melissa to talk about safe routes to school while yeah. we're having the transportation discussion. Is that okay, yeah. Melissa? And, or do well, we you, have any other I, questions I, first? Yeah. I do have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I just had a comment. On Saturday, uh, the local group Mothers Out Front had a meeting, um, Brian and I and some other, you know, there were probably about 10 people there. Their concern is uh, particularly sidewalks and children and safe sidewalks. So they're getting involved. Um, it was a good meeting. Right. And remember, they, they come at it with the angle of reducing our carbon footprint so yeah. that we're yeah, neutral. Um, so uh, I missed the presentation, you know, that was done a few weeks ago. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, in terms of policy, having a complete streets policy, maybe I missed something here. I blipped out here for a second while you guys were talking about this thing you're going to get involved with. But um, so what is the next step? And when you have a complete streets policy, and if MVRPC has, you know, some rules about what that means, does that give us less flexibility as we're thinking? I mean, I've always thought there's streets in some neighborhoods where people, there's no sidewalks, people walk on the streets, they bike on the streets, and they drive on the streets. Um, all those things happen. They wheel their babies down the street um, and walk their dogs down the street and all of that. Um, so they're already being used you know, in this kind of complete way. The traffic is, tends to be slow on those kind of streets. Um, and so I'm wondering, I guess I'm wondering sort of what's the next step and does it force us, does something about this force us to do, I know it says nothing particular, you know, that it's individualized uh, planning is the way I understood that, um, street by street or whatever, but um, does it actually leave the, keep things flexible for the community like or not. Chris? I can take it or take yeah. it, but yeah, Matt. Uh, I heard a couple of questions. So one is about our own, po the MVRPC regional policy. That only applies when you're applying to us for funds and there's the 
funds that we, the federal transportation funds that we allocate across the region are only applicable to certain classifications of roads and there are only two three excuse me three such roads within the village so if you were applying for something along Xenia Avenue uh, Dayton Street or Fairfield, Fairfield Fairfield Yellow Springs Road those would be the three roads where our funds would actually be eligible and for projects applying to us you would need to apply uh, um, you would need to conform with our policy for regional complete streets which means you need to take into account the needs of all current and projected non-motorized users. Um, uh, the policy is very flexible. It has exceptions built into the policy if there are, are reasons for an exception. Um, but is it just a is it just uh, meeting your standard on those streets or do you have it's, to it's have not a design village? standard. It's not a design okay. standard. It requires that the project consider the needs of all users okay. and accommodate any projected current or future need. Um, your village policy would apply to all other projects within the village, um, presumably, and could be written as you wish to uh, be flexible, um, which is what uh, the National Complete Streets Coalition recommends, is that you have a very context sensitive, flexible policy. Um, you described some of the neighborhood streets just uh, in, your, in your remarks just now uh, regarding people pushing strollers down the street. Uh, it is very likely that many of the neighborhood streets in Yellow Springs are already complete because they're not handling freight traffic um, and they are adequately storing cars that are parked on the on the berm and they are adequately providing safe, comfortable um, uh, 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 transportation up, up and down the street and across the street for people pushing their most precious child in a, in a, in a stroller or walking their dog. So um, it, is, it is entirely um, reasonable for you to write a policy that would allow for the, cons the, the decision that that street is already complete and does not need change in any way. It would be perfectly reasonable for you to write a policy in that way. And to grant yourself, the village, the flexibility that you would want to be able to do that um, on, on any number of streets that are, that are perhaps more complicated than a, than a quiet residential street. So is our next step that we develop a policy that kind of has this uh, yeah. overview, kind of holistic approach, and then... That exactly, yes, and that's, that's kind of what we had put on our sort of timeline is we'd have a workshop, we'd have a, uh, this presentation, and then we'd, um, with the assistance, I think, of the Active Transportation Committee, develop, uh, you know, a recommendation. Um, uh, MVRPC has a 2011 award-winning uh, complete streets policy. Um, but as Matt said, I, I, I would imagine we would be customizing it um, in a lot of different ways. But what I think is particularly valuable is if we had something like this in place, we may have constructed Dayton Street differently or West South College differently. Some of these streets that have become problems. We might have thought about putting Sharrows down from the get-go or not having side paths. And I think that's kind of the, the policy level consideration that this would help us with. I think as, as we're investing, I mean, we're, we're, we repaved a few streets. I mean, there could have been things, and we could probably still add them, but this is similar to the, the dig ones policy. When we take up a street and we're, we look at the water lines and the sewer lines, you know, you don't, you, you want to take care of everything at once when you can, and, and so this is very similar to that, um, just related to, to transportation and to walking and biking, so. Um, and I guess I do want to clarify, I think, the complete streets policy is complementary to our active transportation planning process, but they are separate. Um, so, um, my sense is, Judith, correct me if I'm wrong, that you might be concerned about limiting options, mm -hmm. and yeah. I think the idea is to increase options. Mm -hmm. So how, how that gets done. Well, and, and Judith, if you recall, I mean, we were we were part of that very first sidewalk discussion where. It was insisted upon that we have to have sidewalks on both sides of every street. If you remember, that's what 
shut the very first discussion down back, back in Eric ago. Swanson's oh. time. <laughs> And when we knew it was physically and financially impossible, and I think that, that that's what we're evolving to, is recognizing that that isn't required, that, that you look at each street independently and, and you figure out what each street needs. So um, I think, and, and we really progressed through that. John Young helped us kind of get through that too in that discussion. And I, I will say, I know that's not what we're talking about now, but in terms of paying for sidewalks, to me, this supports even more the fact that the village has taken responsibility for that because it's, you know, whole neighborhoods do not have sidewalks, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then there's whole neighborhoods that do. And so to me, it just seems like a fairness question. I, I, I know that's not what we're discussing, but that, I just feel. It, this reinforces my sense that that is the right policy. Right. Matt, how many um, municipalities have complete street policies in the Miami Valley region? Uh, let me just list them out. D Dayton, Riverside, Troy, Piqua. Can't think of any others. So f four that I know of okay. that are codified in some way. Yeah. Cool. Because okay. one thing I do want to throw out there before we uh, leave this discussion is, uh, and Chris might have been on this call, the active transportation team that uh, we got the grant for our active transportation plan from uh, is focusing on a state level complete streets policy. And the way this has gone down in other states is that it directly ties to funding. And so, I mean, this is at the nascent stages, but I believe that by passing this policy, we put ourselves in a great position for the future. And you know, there are states like Massachusetts, California, I mean, that have these state level ones. Um, that has become, particularly for state funding, uh, important. So, so, just so what is the next step then? Um, to, uh, I, I guess I'd like to, uh, with the help of the Active Transportation Committee, uh, put together a draft policy based on some of the best practices that we could then start to look at and discuss. Mm -hmm. So while we're talking about transportation and active transportation, Melissa, could you just give a little review of where we are on safe routes to school? Um, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm going to give, just because I've got it here at my fingertips, kind of an update on everything because there's quite a few sidewalk related projects that are going on right now. Um, the Mothers Out Front group that met, I think it was on Saturday, I wasn't able to go. So I put together a four-page document of all of the projects that are going on and where they're all at. So I'll just give everybody the cliff notes real quick. Um, so we have three sidewalk-related projects going on um, right now in some sort of a stage. Um, the first is the Safe Routes to School project. From what I could find, and this might be wrong, um, this project dates back to 2013, and maybe it's much longer than that. But some of the dates that I had seen, um, it looked like it really started to kick up in 2013. Um, it's changed hands a number of times, and it, I, it landed with me in late 2015. Um, and what this consists of um, are sidewalk, new sidewalk installation um, that's going to be along um, Yellow Springs Fairfield Road and Winter Street. So the portion along Yellow Springs Fairfield Road um, will go from uh, North Stafford uh, to Fair Acres Drive. And then the village will be paying for the portion um, that goes from uh, Yellow Springs, Fairfield to North Winter. And um, is that right? No, no, no that's we're paying not right. For Stafford it's to backwards. Fair Acres. Yeah, I've got it backwards. So um, the ODOT is, is paying for the bulk of this project, and um, the village is paying for a very small portion to finish it out from um, Yellow Springs, Fairfield to, is it Stafford? Yeah, from Stafford to Stafford. To Acres, yeah, yeah, to Fair Acres. Wow. <laughs> I'm looking at a very small map, um, and there's so much going on. Um, so that project is finally starting construction that starts with tree remo removal on October 23rd. So we will be getting a letter out to all um, residents in that area that will be impacted. So we're not real sure what the weather is going to do since it's coming up into the uh, it, winter season um, potentially. So it will be completed by the end of the year, so we'll be really glad to get that off of, um, off of the books in terms of a long-standing project. So October 23rd, starting with tree removal in that area, and everybody will be notified. 
Um, there is another project that's getting ready to um, start up. Um, Denise Swinger and I started working in 2015 to secure funding to replace old sidewalk ramps in the village that weren't ADA compliant. And what we were focused on was connecting the central business district and the two schools with a complete loop. So that would be Xenia Avenue, Dayton Street, East Enon Road, and uh, South College, uh, West South College. So there were a total of 63 ramps that needed to be redone. So the ramps were going to be torn out and they were going to be replaced with ADA compliant ramps. Um, with the domes that have the the bumps on them and actually that's 79 79 total ramps so the very first grant that was accepted um, which is getting ready to uh, start construction was a green county community development block grant so this was through the green county department of development this was going to replace 16 ramps and domes and 726 feet of concrete walkway along Xenia Avenue from Limestone to South College Street. And I think that that was one of the things that was uh, noted in the uh, complete streets uh, notations that I've seen. Um, so this is going to be 16 of them, and it's going to be in fall of 2017. The co total cost to the village was only 10% of the project, which was $2,600 out of a total project cost of $26,100. So that's great. And then the third project um, would actually, this is where the 63 came in. Um, there were another 63 remaining ramps and domes that were going to be along Dayton, East Enon, and West South College. And this is a, a much bigger uh, project. So um, this, we found out we were awarded in March of 2017 a grant through the Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission for the replacement of the rest of these. Um, and this is federally funded and through the Ohio Department of Transportation, they're gonna be administering this grant. And uh, the total project is $139,180 and the village is responsible for a 25% match of only 33,750. So this project is still in the very early stages and it's got a tentative uh, completion date of July of 2018. This actually, I think, when we applied for this wasn't supposed to be uh, completed. None of these projects were supposed to be completed until 2020. So since our uh, project was much smaller than a lot of the other ones that were um, applied and um, applied for, then we, we were able to get ours moved up to July of 2018. So as of next summer, um, we'll have three pretty good sized uh, sidewalk projects completed. So right. that's the complete update. Thanks, Melissa. You're welcome. Um, so any comments or questions for any of our three folks that have been, or Brian? Uh, I just want to say uh, how much I appreciate Melissa and Denise Swinger. The, they have gotten us so much money <laughs> uh, through writing really good grants. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they've had ex support from some of the committees of the, of the village and MBRPC, I don't know. Um, but anyway, it's, you know, we're getting a lot for a bang for the buck, you know. Uh, and, and just to add to that, that active transportation planning grant is worth 65000 no matching. So that's great. Yeah, that's awesome. Great. Any? Okay. Thank All you. Right. Thank you Thank so you. much Thanks, for Matt. coming Thanks, from Kim. Dayton. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Chris. Enjoy those Wyasopoly games. <laughs> uh, next, uh, we have Justice System Task Force report to council. Um, Judith, do you want to start this off? Well, I'll just introduce um, Pat DeWeese uh, wrote the draft of this report. She's going to present it. She's one of the members of the, of the task force. And I think uh, in uh, this annual report, you will see that this task force is, you know, after kind of, I mean, it's a huge job that we were asked to do. I think it makes me aware as a council member that new commissions and task force of the council, it takes a while to get on their legs. It took us a little while. Um, and we've gotten some things done, so very proud of the work that the task force has done. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for the chance to report in. Um, you have the report, and I'm just going to assume that everyone's read it, so I'm not going to read through the entire thing, but I'll highlight things that happened. Um, and I want to start with, um, I did sort of put into the front of the report a reminder that the task force um, really 
was put in place in the spring of 2016. I mean, or the ordinance was 2016. So the task force was not set up to respond to the critical incident of New Year's Eve. And that's been a misunderstanding in some places. So although we were, of course, affected by New Year's Eve, like the entire village, but our charge was not to fix things that happened there. So just want to be clear about that. So in 2017, we came up with five recommendations, and uh, they were all accepted by the council. And I'll just quickly go through what happened after they were accepted. Um, the first one we did was a revision of the TAS taser use guidelines in the general orders. And uh, Ellis Jacobs, who's an attorney and a member of the task force, worked with Chief Brian Cla uh, Carlson to um, complete wording to the revision, and they inserted the revision into the general orders, replacing the former section. So that's done. Um, then we did ask that the council direct the police department to ensure that the department completed implicit bias training by January of 2018. And um, several things happened. Uh, uh, interim chief then, uh, Carlson hired a speaker to come in, a motivational speaker, to raise awareness about prejudice and uh, implicit bias. Um, and a few other things have followed up, but we have realized that um, we're probably being naive in thinking this could be accomplished by January of 2018. So we're still ongoing in terms of looking at the most effective kind of what would be evidence-based training in this arena. Uh, implicit bias is a pretty new concept and there's a lot of people who jumped on the bag bandwagon with their workshops and their books and their tapes and not all of it has been tested really. So we're still looking at what is the most uh, effective kind of training that's out there. Um, we also asked that the council direct the police department to recommit to crisis intervention training, the CIT training, and that happened. And that training, which was actually supported by former Chief Hale and then has continued to be supported um, by Chief Carlson, we're pretty far along. I would say, is it every officer or almost every officer? One left. One left. Okay, so we really made great progress. Mm -hmm. And that means that on every shift there will be someone who has had this training, completed this training. And this is a very well established uh, training uh, by the uh, National Association for the Mentally Ill, the NAMI people. So um, it's great stuff, and we have all the officers trained, all but one. And I think it's good to highlight here that this is the 40-hour yes, CIT. Big, it's a big commitment. Right. Um, we've accomplished that. So that um, I should say Chief Carlson has accomplished that. I'm, <laughs> we all had the great idea that that should happen. And he's also um, promoted de-escalation in general as the way that we want our officers to respond to situations. Um, we also asked in April that um, the council direct uh, village manager and the chief of police to pursue the hiring of a social worker. And a group of people, uh, including Kate Hamilton, who's on the task force at HRC, and Chief Carlson, and our village human resource officer, uh, Ruth Ann Willick and uh, Patty, have worked on a job description for what they're calling an outreach specialist. And that job description will come to council, I think, at the next meeting. Yeah, are, you're about ready with that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that will be um, a great benefit to the department. Um, the, uh, in May, the task force uh, recommended ex expanding the use of the mayor's court for violations that are allowed in the mayor's court. And um, officers have increased the use of the mayor's court for minor violations. Um, the mayor's court includes a lot of pretty complex issues. And there's a working group in the task force that is still researching and considering um, the best recommendation in regards to the use of a prosecutor in the court and also determining which violations are best sent to uh, the municipal court. So they're continuing their work and they're very close to bringing forward more recommendations, but being very aware that we'll have a new mayor uh, fairly soon and that he or she will probably have their own ideas about how the mayor's court is um, developed. So um, 
those were the recommendations that were accepted and that have been acted on. And then in addition to that, we want to mention that the community guidelines, which were worked on and led by the 365 police subgroup, um, were also supported and edited by the Justice System Task Force. And they have been adopted by the council. And um, our next step is that Chief Carlson is working with Chris to find ways of inserting that language into the preamble of the general order. So it will become part of the documentation of the general orders of the police department. And also, when we way back when, when we were considering a wide search uh, for a new chief, um, Janet Mueller and I and Patty spent a number of hours mm -hmm. <laughs> coming up with a lot of a job description and a hiring plan and a lot of um, really good materials, which I think will still be useful in any hiring that goes forward uh, with sergeants, captains, and at some point in the very far future, a new chief. The materials can also be used as uh, performance evaluation materials. So that was another accomplishment. Um, just carrying on, there are currently three groups that are continuing their research and study. That's on page three. You can take a look at that. Um, but I would say overall we feel that um, villagers are pretty happy with uh, the change in approach and philosophy of the police department. Um, and there are, are um, ways that the task force, looking, at, looking back at that framework that we've explained before, the six pillars from uh, President Obama's 2015 task force on the new direction for community policing, um, we feel that task force and working with the department village manager, council, and a number of citizens. Um, I don't have, I should have, I neglected the names of all the citizens who've jumped in to work with the task force who are not on the task force. But we've had a lot of interested citizens who've worked on these projects as well. Um, so we feel we've addressed almost all of these issues and would continue to address these issues that are part of the framework uh, that is used by OPADA and is part of that um, national initiative to uh, look at a new direction for policing. So questions, comments? Uh, well, I will start with uh, this is very helpful. Thanks for okay. taking the time to summarize this. Sure. Um, and the other thought I had, because um, I thought it was interesting the note on the bottom of page three about the, uh, the retrenchment on the federal level with uh, drug enforcement. And I, I feel like that also uh, brings to mind what's going on with, with ICE and all the other uh, things you know, related to those issues. And um, you know, I, I guess I just want to put that out there as I think they're related um, problems that we need to uh, address. Yeah. So well, we would very much like to reform the federal government, but we <laughs> well, we need to be mindful how it affects how it us might on the local. How impact sure. Our village. Right. I so I just I think that, you know, bringing that up also thinking about this, you know, attack on uh, immigrants is important. Sure. Absolutely. What would, would that uh, would that make sense for the justice task force to look at? I don't know if you know that the village did pass uh, a yes, document. Sanctuary cities. Well, well it was no, not it's called not sanctuary well, cities. It was not, not called a, sanctuary it, village. But, but yeah. Um, but at any rate, it does, given what's happening at the state level too, uh, it does have some impacts for our police department, elected uh, officials. Actually, the chief and Chris and I are talking about that because uh, it came up at a, I think at the last meeting, mm -hmm. and chief was asked about the response under certain circumstances, and so chief and Chris and I have been talking about that, and I think chief is going to be bringing something back to council to kind of explain that. Okay, that's great. It's like it's getting attention at the right place. Yeah. Any other questions? No, great job. Um, yeah, very good. And, and are, so you, what do you see as the future as, as far as the group, as far as how Well, our long charge is a two-year charge, so okay. we have one more year. And as I said, we have working groups. We have a mayor's court working group. And they're, I wouldn't say they're close to completion, but they're very far along. They'll be bringing further uh, recommendations. There is a very interesting, uh, in, the, in the police working group, there's a project that we'll probably be bringing to council 
not the next time, maybe the next time, maybe the time after that. But this was the uh, data analysis project that uh, council or I don't know if it's the council or village manager agreed to fund the analysis through the right state um, statistical program, statistical consulting center. So that's a very interesting report and you know a way of looking at what, how do we use um, the reporting of the department to examine issues that might come up or questions or future direction. So that's something that's being worked on actively. Um, we're continuing the research into the best practice on training, particularly the implicit bias training. And there is a narrative group which included teen representatives who were, who did some work um, trying to get a general perception from young people uh, about police, per their perceptions of fairness uh, in their interactions with the police. And um, they really didn't have great success with that, but they still felt there's some work to be done with how to interact with young people. And I know that Chief carlson has been working on that as well, so. Great. I was gonna say, um, part of, it's kind of like the housing needs assessment. There's the data, and there's, and there's these discussions with, right. with people. Mm -hmm. And so, so I think in order to really have a full, a, a, better, a fuller understanding uh, of that data report, that, I think that's part of the reason that they wanted to also be doing interviews. Um, but, you know, it's, that's in the future. It's yeah. in the future. Okay. Um, I wanted to um, add in, um, so, um, well, in terms of what's coming up, the, the uh, task force, we looked back at the um, resolution that formed the task force to sort of think about, so what are the next steps? And those discussions are coming, really, this next meeting. We started talking about it at our last meeting. We're uh, going to be talking about it at this meeting. Um, there's been, you know, so there's been some proposals uh, that people have put forward. Um, uh, Pat is looking, Pat was bringing uh, the idea of, of looking at the use of cameras. Um, also, the idea of what happens kind of after the task force, sort of looking forward, you know, because um, this work is probably going to need to continue in some form. Um, there's also been a uh, proposal for policy projects that would focus at drug control policy. Um, the justice system's disparate impacts on the poor and then the continuing work on the data collection and also developing a policy around that so that data continues to be collected to, so we, you know, for the, um, so we kind of can know and the police department can know kind of what's going on. Um, and then also another policy project focus that's being suggested is moving and parking violation education is what it's being called. So those discussions are going forward. Um, Pat, Ellis, myself, Chief Carlson and Patty Bates um, met last week. Oh, and uh, Chris was on the phone um, because, you know, there was still this question sort of hanging out there about how we want, how the council um, can ensure that these critical changes um, that the that the council, the task force is recommended, councils kind of shook their head yes, that those things um, cannot be amended, they can't be modified or repealed without a process that would require council and community discussion. So, um, so uh, we, we want to, so we talked and Chris and Patty and the chief, I think are in agreement there is a way to do that through a form of legislation. And I don't know if Chris wants to say a little bit more about that, if we want to just wait. Um, but so, you know, given the recommendations thus far, there's, um, I think the next meeting, if she, we, I know council had asked, don't bring us four different proposals at the same meeting. It's too much for us to, to process and to take the time to be thorough about. Um, so if uh, Chief is bringing the social worker proposal that is, is, is uh, changing to something slightly different, that if that's coming at the next meeting, then another issue is the taser policy um, that was recommended. And Chief and um, Sergeant Watson, well, we tried to meet with both of the sergeants, but um, uh, Sergeant Knapp was not here when we met. But um, so, 
So anyway, it seems to me that if the next meeting we talk about the social worker job, which is something slightly different now, um, that, that maybe the meeting after that, that we look at that TASER policy change. Um, so, and then um, my own sense is that in terms of training, I would like to see, I don't know how the rest of council feels, that at some point, um, you know, Chief Carlson's very committed to the, you know, the de-escalation training, the CIT training, and whatever we're going to figure out about the whole issue of bias training or what, how to <coughs> affect uh, that whole area of policing, um, and that's something we still have to figure out. But at some point, I mean, I would like to see council also, um, you know, weigh in on that, you know, in terms of um, making sure that once, you know, in, in the coming years, these things remain in place. And my own sense is that de-escalation training, and, the, and Chief really brought this um, uh, very, you know, fully committed to this idea. I'm feeling it was a very important, I just want to say, I think it's the foundation of, 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 you know, excellent policing and the kind of policing we want to see in the community, is that when something happens, that the police officers are de-escalating the situation. And I think that will lead to a lot of positives, you know, in a broad variety of ways. So, so that's, how does that sound? Sounds good. Okay. And I, I would just like to note, um, Melissa and I are going to the um, International City County Management Association conference later this month. And Melissa will be attending a session on uh, body cameras for police and I will be attending a session on implicit bias. Hmm. So hopefully we'll come back with some information that we can use to to you know uh, work on some of those topics. Sounds good. I, can I just add one thing to that? Um, just to say that Chief's um, asking his uh, department members to participate in the uh, Yellow Springs Black History events, mm -hmm. that is the sort of thing that is seen, you know, that, uh, that <laughs> ongoing, you know, connecting to uh, the African American community, that is seen as a very important way that can be, can really have a positive impact. So I think Chief's, you know, his insights into this has, has been very positive. So. And, and Patty, what's the status of who um, is attending the restorative, some or all of the restorative justice um, symposium? I am attending Friday night as is, uh, I believe, Officer Bennington, and then Chief and all of Council are scheduled for the full symposium. I'm, I'm not going to be at the full symposium, okay, but I'll be as much as I can, yeah. yeah. I'm also planning on going on Friday. Okay. So. And I plan on being at home. Yes, you, you should each have found your tickets yeah. at your The whole council yes. has tickets. So. All right. Okay, great. Thank you. And thank you so much, Pat. And thanks to the rest of the group. Dave, thank you both so much. Um, next item on the agenda is the Arts Council Permanent Collection Discussion. And who's going to start that? I think uh, we'll bring Brittany Baum up to get that going. And. Um, by the way, we also have a, a, a lovely visual PowerPoint to uh, run throughout the uh, presentation. Ready to hit it? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Um, my name is Brittany Baum. For those of you that have not met me, I am a villager and I'm also on the Art and Cultural Commission. Um, for the last year or so, since actually since I've been a member of the commission, We've been working on ways to bring art back to the John Bryant Community Center. Um, it is our recommendation after meeting with the Arts Council and uh, Nancy Mellon from the Arts Council, we strongly believe that we should be working with the Arts Council to get art back into the John Bryant Community Gallery. Um, after talking to her for some time, we discovered that um, their permanent collection may need to find a new home soon since it's currently located at Antioch Midwest and that building is for sale. Um, so I'm actually here to introduce Nancy to kind of give you guys a little more information on the permanent art collection. But um, on behalf of the Art and Cultural Commission, we would like to propose that we accept their artwork. So Nancy, if you'd like to talk. 
Thank you. Thank you. This is just a little booklet. Yep. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Brian told me I had to keep it short. He oh. said three minutes. So put it on. She's going to tell me because I didn't work out with it. Uh, he also told me that I should just have bullet points and speak off the top of my head. So I'm going to do a little of that and a little not of that. But I have made six questions to answer. The first one is, who's in the collection? Anyone is in the collection who is a local artist. So this is most of the collection, but not all of it that you're seeing here. The collection is made up of artists who are just starting out their career and who have been in it many, many years. Who started the collection and takes care of the collection? Well, the Arts Council started it 25 years ago. Happy birthday, permanent <laughs> collection. Um, and we now have a 10-person stewardship committee that takes care of the collection because we care very strongly about this collection. Then the next question is, why collect local art? And this is my favorite question because I love collecting local art. We have 179, actually, 180 pieces as of a couple weeks ago in the collection. Mm. Mm. This is Marianne Britton's. It just came from the Springfield Art Museum oh. where a show was going on. It's mm. now in the permanent collection. There are stories behind this piece. So the art is not just beautiful art, though we do have so much beautiful art, but it's also stories of our friends and our neighbors because we're all artists in some way. Mm. So I collect local art. We all collect local art. Who's the collection for? Us, the village, our visitors, the artists. It's for all of us. This collection really is for all of us. It's being collected for us. It's our history. Why public art? Well, it starts conversations. It tells stories of who we are, what we believe in, and what we cherish. Just by being here, it shows people what we care about. Freedom of speech, creativity, discourse, public art lifts our souls. And why is John Bryan Center the right place for this permanent collection? It's our main village gathering place. It's a center for plans and dreams, security, justice, and community fun. And this building needs to needs art to enfold all the life that goes on in it. As you look around in your hallways right now, they're just a building. And yet what goes on in here is not just a building, it's a community's life. So we need art in this community building. Art will speak to who we are, that we are creators and makers and thinkers. We're rebels and peace lovers. I almost put in an idiots, but I didn't. <laughs> we are contentious and dramatic and different, and we are not boring, and neither is art. We care about so many things. So let's fill the John Bryan Center with art and let the conversations roll. Mm -hmm. That's all. Did I make my point? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy, and thanks, Brittany. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. Or Susan. It's not all of it. That was to leave the screens. This is an old piece. It's beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to watch them all. I know you want to go on. That one actually came mm -hmm. through the jungle, and that was um, <laughs> from Chris uh -huh. Hill. Oh, wow. And Hannah and Dick so Northway, Prentice Thomas. Yet. That's only out of Goss. And there's Wheeling Goss, I'm sure, by Brian Mom. Mm -hmm. This collection is made up of so many different kinds of art, and it's still alive. It's growing. It's growing all the time. Mm. 
One so, of the neat things about it is the history. I mean, that, you know. And that, we're collecting historical information, too. Um, just like I brought with this. Nancy, why don't you come back up? Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> like I brought with this piece from Marianne Britton, um, a press release that was about her. One of my favorite parts is it says, Marianne put her heart and soul into everything she put her hands to. She used to say, anything worth doing is worth doing to excess. <laughs> <laughs> we have stories about all this art. We have things that, I don't know, it's just so much part of our historical background. Do you have any questions? I have an unrelated question. What is, ha <laughs> what is happening to the Will uh, William Gaunt um, sculpture project? It's in the midst of being on its way. There is a group of or nonprofit organizations, art and historical ones, um, 365 group, um, the Arts Council, uh, the Historical Society, uh, the Chamber, the, um, I'm missing some, the Heritage um, Project. Um, they're getting together regularly, they're working on it, and we're on our way. And the Arts and Culture Commission yes, is uh, yes, is wonderful. going to be more involved with that coalition as well. Yes, awesome. we've been discussing yeah, it. It's, it's very exciting. Any other questions? So I, I just want to say, I mean, I'm excited to have it come back. I think we've got some, you know, we're, I think most people think about the walls and more, you know, flat pieces of art. Obviously, there's a lot in this collection that's 3D. You know, we actually do have some display cases that I hope that you can use. Um, just keep in mind what that the rooms are used like A and B is used quite often and there's there's projection we need walls for projection and just make sure that things aren't hung in a way that um, because nobody wants to touch it obviously and just just to make sure that the that the space is able to be used right. and and we did get the walls in the hallway here painted Yes. I saw, <laughs> wow. and we have all that lovely new space. Yeah. And I, I mean, I love the idea of, of hanging, you know, doing it in a way that doesn't damage the walls. And I'm, so I'm sure you'll use some sort of uh, the display bar that's already there. Is that going to be able to work? Yes, though we are talking about maybe getting some other things that will hang from there because then it'll make it easier for putting it up and down and changing things. I have. Question. And the Arts and Culture Commission has some budget for supporting yeah, the gallery we that we already discussed. approved. So, so given the fact that you and Corrine are sitting here, I just had an idea because we're talking about village public art and village owned property. Is there any possibility that any of this can make its way back into the restrooms at the train station? We can discuss Think that about at it. another time. Think <laughs> about it. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? So what do we need to do as a council? Um, well, I mean, I, I think this has been brought as a recommendation, um, and so I think we probably Chris, should Chris, what vote. do you think we need to do? Vote? Just vote? Do we need legislation or just vote on a motion? You could do it on a motion if you want. If you wanted to memorialize it in a more permanent way, I think do it by resolution. So let's do it by resolution at the next meeting. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, and I do just want to highlight, uh, I, I thought Nancy did an incredible job with talking about these phases and how we can start moving art in. Um, Patty has been really helpful about looking at priority areas as we kind of lay that out. And then highlighting the educational piece. And um, I also think it's really cool as we get farther down the road, um, Nancy is offering to, and the Arts Council to our staff, to choose pieces from the collection that they can have in their offices. So it's going to be fun. Awesome. Great. And I do want to point out, um, yes, I did meet and talk with uh, Nancy and Brian about this. And I got the walls painted. But um, it will be Melissa that um, they will be working with because Melissa is the artistic one of the two of us sitting here, and so I've asked her to um, take that duty and make those selections. Thanks, everyone. So we'll have legislation at the next meeting, and so you're, I think you're hearing a lot of support. So if you want to come for the actual reading of the legislation, you're more than welcome. <laughs>
All right, thanks a lot. Thanks. Um, we added the housing needs assessment as housing needs assessment update to the agenda. Marianne, do you want to take that or should yes. Patty? Okay, go ahead. I, I do. Um, we, our team, which includes uh, Karen, myself, Patty, Melissa, Denise, as well as Kevin Magruder and Liz Voigt, have been working with uh, Bowen, the uh, company, Bowen Research, that'll be gathering the data. And we pretty much have down a list of stakeholders, pe uh, people who have leadership in particular uh, domains in regard to housing. And uh, we've been working on a survey with them, and the survey is probably pretty much complete both for state for the stakeholder survey as well as for the citizen survey so that part is moving along uh, and then there will be some individual uh, interviews with a, a select group of people but the one the part that I Wait, want can I ask a question who are the stakeholders it's a list of how many people about 30, 30 who are they? I mean, what kind I, I'm of I can't tell you the name. Oh, I don't I need can, to know the names, I, but I, how I, do you become a stakeholder or not? Well, I mean, I'm just it, curious. it's, oh no, that's not it. it. It's a list that got passed around through all of the people who Community organizations, um, uh, housing organizations, local and county housing organizations. Faith-based faith developers, based, um, persons of color, education. Um, it's a pretty comprehensive list mm -hmm. and it I'm happy to how many people send it six or seven people it went through seven people and we each added our recommendations to to the stakeholder list um, but what we what I'm concerned about and why I wanted to well there are two reasons I wanted to bring it to council one because I want to keep it in the public eye and to keep council updated um, but the, the piece that I wanted to talk about was the focus group piece. Uh, we said that we wanted to have a way for citizens to come together in small groups to talk about housing and uh, address particular questions. And oh, it, tentatively, we have plans to have a, a group or more than one group meet at the senior center uh, one or more groups meet at either the high school or the elementary school. And uh, one or more groups meet at the AME church. And we have reached out to the senior center and uh, the schools and, and um, the church and different groups who will be helping um, notify people, encourage people to attend. Um, a question has come up. Um, because we were planning on having these group meetings probably in the second half of October, maybe early November, uh, and um, which sort of squeezes them into a very uh, busy time mm -hmm. here. You know, elections coming up. I mean, we have these several workshops and conferences that are coming up. And so the last email that came from uh, uh, Desiree, who works at, the, at Bowen, um, made a suggestion, as did Liz Voigt, uh, which said that maybe we should consider waiting until after we get all of the, basically, the hard data and have the, have the focus groups meet after the holidays. And I'm just going to read what she said because I think it explains it well. She says, you could push the focus groups off until after the holidays and once the study is done and in your hands. That way you could use the focus groups in tandem with the study's recommendations and conclusions as a way of allowing the community to pro provide input on the implementation and prioritization of these recommendations. <coughs> we will have enough community input from the stakeholder and resident surveys that adding the focus group probably is not going to tell us anything we don't already know or find out. <laughs> Moving them to after the holidays would take the pressure off you guys and us and give the village a way of contributing to the village moving forward. Um, I mean, the main reason why I thought it was important to have the groups 
was to allow people to actually have interaction and talk about it, have people more own this thing. And um, I, I'm thinking that maybe it would make sense to move the focus groups afterwards. And so I wanted to open it up both for Well, the, to the benefit of having them after um, the report comes in is that the report is going to provide some, some recommendations as to how to proceed. And, then the input, input could be specifically on how do we proceed based on these recommendations um, to, to achieve the goals, uh, you know, instead of, because we do have the comprehensive stakeholder list. I, um, I think it's a good idea, but not just to comment on what, the, you know, what the um, report says, but to, <laughs> kind of check the report, does it feel accurate? Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want just, mm -hmm. you know, what do you think of this suggestion mm -hmm. or that suggestion, but does this seem accurate? Because mm -hmm. uh, that was my understanding, was that that is part of the reason that you have these kind of discussions, is to, that that actually increases the level of accuracy, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I but I like the idea of waiting because I think if we rush it, there's not going to be as much participation. Um, I think it's going to take some, you know, with every kind of important issue of the village, um, we have discussions here, you know, council and, you know, we're having these conversations and we think everybody's aware of it. It takes months, I think, for the community to catch up because they're busy doing their lives and they're just kind of trusting us to do the right thing. But on something this important, we do want that, uh, a high level of participation and um, it's going to take some time to garner the focus of the community to show up, I think, so. Mm -hmm. I guess for me, I feel like the ideal would be some of both. Um, I mean, I, I don't, I, since I'm not directly involved in the conversations, I don't understand, you know, exactly what the nature of the data and, and you know, but when Patty talked about recommendations, um, I mean, there's something I think important about, you know, having those checks throughout the process and, um, I agree that we might not have as much participation in November, say, but I don't know if there's room to try some of that just kind of for testing out like maybe what are we missing before we get that data report. I don't know. So I mean, I'm wondering when, do, when, when does it come back to, at what points is it important for us to be also well, having our input? That was the question I was going to ask. At what, mm -hmm. When w would this report go to these focus groups, would, would council have a discussion? Would, would Bowen do the presentation to council? Would there be kind of a formal acceptance of it and then it go to the community or to these focus groups? I mean, that would be kind of interesting. I, I, I don't think that was clear um, in what Desiree was suggesting. I, I do. I, I, yeah. Well, I, my understand, I mean, how we had planned it at <coughs> any rate was that Bowen would make the presentation to council in December of their right. findings. Mm -hmm. But but how does that integrate with so so they would make the presentation and then I guess then there would be some some work with the focus groups. Okay. They, well I don't think that Bowen would consider the focus groups at all in in their presentation. What they would work from would be the stakeholder list and interviews and the citizen survey responses. And isn't there some provision of having some one-on-one -on -one conversations with yes. some Yeah, yeah we, I think about half a dozen people, I think. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, I think they would use the stakeholder groups in there as, as information, if we did it before. If we did it before, yes. Um, yes. But as she said, it, um, I mean, they're gonna get a lot more data from the surveys, hopefully, than from you know, how many people would come to the small group sessions, however many that would be. Well, and it actually could be kind of interesting to really take the, the data that's more, you know, that, that's a little bit more cut and dried and then take that data and then get the, the um, kind of parse it out a little bit and really understand it. And as Judith said, present it to people, say, is this mm -hmm. how, is this your perception? And, mm -hmm. you know, there may be data that's gathered that is surprising and it, you know maybe it'll change some minds or it'll 
Um, so I think that there is definitely something to be said for um, before we go on to the next step of, say, policy or whatever it might be, that there, that that's when that community mm -hmm. interaction occurs. I mean, the, the one problem that I worry about a little bit is I think the people most in need <laughs> are the people that often are not a part of these processes. Uh, and so thinking about how do we get you know, that higher level of participation from I think it's easier to get participation with a, with a <laughs> survey. I think, I think an online survey is potentially gonna, going to capture, and I think maybe we should have a written, that isn't something that we had talked about. Is there, is, had we talked about any kind of a written survey? We yeah. have a written component to it? Oh, yeah. That, I mean, I thought it was an online. I assume this was oh, an online survey. Oh, you mean hard survey. copy? Yes. I think they were going to be providing hard copy, but trying to mostly get people to do online. I'm just thinking of the feedback that we got from the other surveys that we've done and a couple of other topics, that having a hard copy survey seemed to be very helpful. And I think mm -hmm. that is even what where you look at the at particular pick key people that, that have connection to particular communities and say, you know, maybe we have a little piece of paper, we have a brochure, we have, say, here's the website, you know, whatever it is that you go do this survey at, or they give them the piece of paper. And to encourage, because I think that that's that peer-to-peer -peer that you're going to get more activity um, and more engagement. Well, remember, we're doing the insert in the news on the 19th of this month. There'll be the insert in the news and part of that will be the survey. And then the, uh, the flip side was intended to be when the focus groups were going to be. So that would be a hard copy in the news. And then um, we could have, we were also considering putting the reminder in the utility bills um, that people received on November 1st so that um, they could all, you know, there would be that last minute reminder towards the end that you could participate in the survey. But I think what Karen and Judith are talking about, because this was my comment when we mentioned kind of the places, like the senior center, because uh, I've been thinking a lot about this with a last conference I went to, like the Spirited Goat, for example. That seems to be a gathering place where I think some folks that maybe Judith was thinking about would be and maybe there does need to be some kind of different approach. These are probably people that aren't going to get the YS News and do that survey. And I, I <coughs> know and work with a person who I think will be a great connection yep. to encourage those, those surveys from, from a lot of that um, younger group, um, people that might feel a little bit disenfranchised. Um, and I, I think that's important. I, to, are yeah. we going to have any, are, you know, I, although having a bunch of paper surveys floating around gives me a little pause related to control and because I assume that there is some process with the online that may, that in a, ensures that only one response from one computer. Well, it's, it's address based I think is what Desiree said um, in, in one of her emails is that they were adding a, a question to say, you know, um, what is your address or something along those lines and um, how many, you know, people are in your household and we did do hard copy surveys um, with the fiber project fiber um, mm -hmm. advisory board project and we did get quite a large response so sometimes that is a better method well maybe this is also how we think about you know if we do some initial data gathering we're going to have demographics on who we're getting it from that could direct the, the kind of outreach that we do to see you know if we are if there are gaps so that's something to think about. Mm -hmm. And then I come back to the question, you know, uh, Karen, you, you and I said, which is, you know, at what point do, where do we weigh in? I don't want to, I think wait, waiting till the end is not necessarily the right place. They're, are they coming next week to do a presentation? Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're coming. Is it next to do a kickoff? To do a kickoff, yes. To do a kickoff, okay. To talk about what's happening. Okay, okay. And then, I mean, at what place does it make sense 
uh, for council to, because I think we were talking about trying to do that, not just at the beginning and the end, but somewhere, and I'm not quite sure. Um, well, coming back to the paper copy, when, when we did the paper copies for the broadband, mm -hmm. how were those distributed? We put them in the utility bills. But it still wasn't scientifically controlled. Well, really. I mean, maybe we're not going to get scientific control. But this, I, I, I mean, I, this is one when we're spending this kind of money, I think this is one where they would, Bowen, I'm assuming, would want it to be controlled Jeez. to make sure that people aren't returning multiple surveys. I, 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 mean, I, I can't imagine that they want. No, but how, how likely is that, do you think? I, I don't know, but it's, it's, I think we should, you know, we should just, you know, maybe they so have a way So what is your suggestion? Of, just to... Patty said that there was something, that maybe yeah. there's something related to address. I think it's, it's, it says, do you live in Yellow Springs? Right. Did you live in Yellow Springs? I mean, let's, it's in... probably not going to be that big of a deal. I, I am guessing that they probably won't get as many, quite as many paper ones. So let's, mm -hmm. you know, let's maybe ask them if they have any guidance on how to, how to handle the paper, but not make too big of a deal out of it. Yeah. I, I can email Desiree tomorrow okay. and see what, she, <laughs> see what she says. And you know, I mean, maybe we, maybe somebody can. Um, Alex uses her laptop all the time. You know, she's in, she's in, in. Although if it's limited to one, one response per per computer, she wouldn't be able to have multiple people. But it may be it. email related, it would be so email. they can sign. They could sign, yeah. sign it with an yeah, email. Yeah, yeah. So maybe you know, maybe there's something we can do by going to various places, mm -hmm. setting it up so that people can or with go a in, tablet, um, with a tablet, or with um, uh, maybe doing maybe setting aside some time at the at the library or mm -hmm. something. I'm thinking that when they um, make if before those focus groups, that it would be good for council to hear, you know, what they gathered. And, yeah, and that would be a way for the public to hear it. Um, it. It'll help. And then if we have any input we want to have at that point, we can. Does that, is that, 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 that would be. That was the idea. Um, okay. Okay. Well, except, Brian, I heard what you said about doing it both ways. <laughs> but mostly I think I'm hearing people say it seems like it would be better to do the focus groups after. I definitely like the idea of after. Um, and. I would be happy if we did some kind of like check on, you know, just sort of who we're getting input from um, to see if we need to, you know, you do mean on the citizen survey? Yeah, oh, no. so, you know, like sort of once we do that initial survey gathering, just to are check missing, on the demographics. Are we missing a whole right. demographic or, or mm -hmm. they're not fully oh. being yeah. represented? I think from this discussion, my biggest concern is this missing probably two particular populations that may not be as likely to do these surveys or go to the places that we are and so you know but this is, and this is perhaps another place where we can reach out to those stakeholders and and you know maybe have a letter or something to them to say the stakeholders that are that are connected to large organizations mm -hmm. and work with them to set up um, some kind of a process and to encourage their members um, cohort to participate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, new business. The guys came in. They're ready to talk money. <laughs> they want money, I bet. <laughs> Melissa, we'll let you start. Okay, so today in doing all my preparations for this evening, I realized that there were some issues with the online version, so that's why everybody had some things placed at their um, seats this evening. Um, so what I'm going to do is we've got special revenue funds, then we've got capital project and debt service funds, enterprise funds, and then finally the capital budget for all funds. Um, so we're going to go through each of these and I'm going to try to be as succinct as possible in presenting some of this because some of it really, um, especially with the special revenue funds and the capital, pro uh, capital projects and debt service funds, there really isn't any activity. Um, so it's not really 
worth going into a lot of discussion over. So I'm, I'm going to kind of do this the way that I did the general fund. I'm going to give each of these a high level overview and then I'm going to allow anybody that has any questions to ask those. And are we just looking we, at the new, we're just looking at the docs that we Get rid of the old one. Yep. And there are, there are just supposed to be two stapled and one yep. double? Yep, correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the capital projects and debt service funds, the one that was online, that one was unaltered. And the things that were, I'll, I'll go over the, the minor things that were uh, changed. Um, the special revenue funds budget, there really wasn't anything wrong with it. It was, my computer was doing really weird things when I went to hide the cells and some, for some reason the Bryan Center budget got folded in and hidden. Um, and I caught it today, so I fixed it. So the bottom lines and everything were completely unaffected, but you couldn't see the Bryan Center um, mm -hmm. stuff. So that's what changed with the special revenue funds. Okay, so what I did with the special revenue funds um, that's a little different from in years past is I did this cover sheet with the ones that are the most important um, for discussion. So I kind of do this with the enterprise funds too. So. With the special revenue funds, there are actually 12 funds that make up um, the, the spreadsheet that's in front of you or the, the series of uh, budgets that are in, in this first spreadsheet. So we've got four that are the most common um, that I did include in the summary. We've got streets and parks, and then we've got green space, and then we've got the police pension fund. The really big ones worth discussing are streets and parks, um, those two budgets. Uh, green space I note in here just because I know that uh, that's a priority for council. They always like to take a look at uh, where things are with that one, even though I don't have any expenditures coming out of 2018. Um, I figured that council would like <coughs> to take a look at that and discuss. And then the police pension fund, um, it's a very clean in and out. Um, basically that fund is set up to uh, pay the pensions of all of our full-time officers. So there's really not any discretionary spending necessarily, it's just the pensions for our full-time officers that we have. So those are the four more common funds that have more activity or attention um, as it relates to the green space. The other eight funds that make up the rest of the special revenue funds, six of them have no expenditures in 2018. So um, those are the State Highway Fund, the Economic Development Fund, which I know may change in the next year, but for budgeting purposes, I've got that as zero expenditure at this point. Um, the Motor Vehicle License Permissive Tax Fund, Law Enforcement and Education Fund, Federal Forfeited Assets Fund and the State Law Enforcement Trust Fund. Actually, the State Law Enforcement Trust Fund does have some um, expenditures coming out of that. I think that I typically earmark um, 10,000 in that one. Let me take a look at it. Yes, so that one actually did have a, an expenditure in it. Um, and then there were another two that have minimal expenditures, which are the Mayor's Court Computer Fund and our Coats and Supplies Fund, which um, exists from the donations that we take in. So that's the high level overview of, um, of everything that we're going to look at with the special revenue funds. So we'll go ahead and we'll start with our street maintenance and repair fund. This one, um, this one if we take a look at the setup which is very similar to, it's very consistent throughout all the budgets that we're going to look at. We have 2015, 2016 actuals, 2017 budget, 2017 as of the end of August, 2017 projected, and then uh, the 2018 figures. So when we take a look at our street maintenance and repair fund, our revenues are set to come in slightly higher. Um, the majority of that is due to a Safe Routes to School uh, cost reimbursement of $33,000. Um, the rest of that is pretty stable. Um, we only receive a little bit of uh, money into that fund which consists of gasoline tax and motor vehicle licenses. Um, so that's a fairly easy fund in which to predict uh, how much revenue we could possibly bring in. Um, the majority of that fund is, uh, is funded by uh, transfers in that come from the general, uh, general fund. So 
overall revenues were slightly higher as a result of that grant money that came in which was unexpected and then expenditures are about eighty five thousand dollars lower than expected so at the beginning of the year I thought that we would dip into reserves by two hundred and twelve thousand and we're actually set to dip in by eighty four thousand and those reserves basically I like to keep four months worth of operating in those funds. Um, I just transfer enough money in to make sure that we, we uh, maintain those recommended minimum reserves every year. I don't move any more money in than what we actually need because I would much rather leave that in the general fund so that we have that flexibility and I take that same approach with the Parks and Recreation Fund. So I try to move in transfers that are as minimal as possible and if we were to ever need any more money because something would end up happening where we would need more money, we can always move more money in from the general fund. So I always make sure that those transfers are minimal. Um, so for 2018, I've got uh, revenues coming in pretty much consistent, uh, $6,000 less than what the 2017 was pro projected. Um, and then I've got our expenditures coming in uh, less than what our 2017 budget was by about seven or six thousand uh, dollars. So we'll dip into reserves a little bit at the end of 2018, but that will put us at a level where we would leave our recommended minimum reserves in there, which I base those off of our 2016 expenditures. But there were no changes in staffing. Um, let's see, we did have. Let's, nope, I, there was a payment that was paid off, but that was actually not in streets, which I thought it might be. No, it is. Um, we had an international truck payment, and the last payment would be in 2017, so we did have a truck payment that fell off in 2018, which is good. So did anybody have any questions about streets? I know that I give a lot of information very quickly. No? Okay. So we'll move on to Parks and Recreation Fund. And this, this is set up very similar to what streets is. We receive a very minimal amount of money that comes into that fund. Um, the majority of it is our charges for service, which basically is our pool admissions, our uh, rentals from the Bryan Center and then our concessions from the pool as well um, and the rest of it is pretty much made up by the transfer that comes in from the general fund um, so if we take a look at and Melissa what's the what is the rent in this case the rent is Bryan Center mostly um, okay. that's that's pretty much what the bulk of it is. Um, we've got some program receipts, which are like where our softball fees and stuff come into, but rent is pretty much all of our Bryan Center rental fees. And then if anybody would uh, pay to rent the pool facility out, that comes in there too. Okay. So we've got very little money that comes into Parks and Recreation, and most of it's offset by that transfer that comes in. And again, I try to transfer in as little as possible so that we can keep that money in the general fund. Um, so if we look at 2017 budget versus projected, we're bringing in slightly more um, in 2017 than what was budgeted for by about $13,000. And our expenditures are going to be slightly higher than what was um, budgeted for. And that was a result of, um, I think that when we did our supplemental appropriations the last time, there was some insurance that was not accurately budgeted for, um, which I had to, uh, I think it was in the pool. There was some insurance costs and, was it, no, the pool had uh, a little bit of extra personnel cost, but I think it was the Bryan Center um, might have had some health insurance that I didn't have budgeted for accurately. So, um, the expenditures were going to be a little bit more than what I projected um, by $4,000, so it was very minimal. But overall, if you look at our revenues and our expenditures, we would dip into reserves by $51,000 as opposed to $61,000, still maintaining that minimal level that we need for reserves. And if we look at our 2018 budget, um, revenues are projected to be slightly higher and... Um, that is a result mostly of the transfer that we need to uh, offset the 
expenditure increase that we'll see by about forty thousand dollars over 2017 and let me take a look at notes from my parks um, so parks and recreation have four major departments within them they've got parks um, pool Bryan Center and the Bryan Youth Center and most of our increased expenditures um, the pool seen seen some slightly higher expenses and then the Bryan Center uh, seen some increases um, to the wages that were uh, not appropriately budgeted for I I'd shot them a little bit low in 2017 and then we've got some uh, maintenance of facility costs that are going to be a little bit higher with the Bryan Center and then uh, the utility uh, increases um, we'll see some higher utility costs at the Bryan Center as well and then I also increased the Bryan Youth Center budget at the request of Jason and Sam an extra fifteen hundred dollars but they do a lot of fundraising so it pretty much just offsets some of their fundraising efforts that they have um, so related to the pool, it looks to me, I mean, the reason why we brought it back in-house was to save, mm -hmm. and it looks like we have done that, mm -hmm. um, at least, you know, to, to 2016 to 2017. Um, what, what are the 2018 budget numbers specifically about the pool based on? So like personnel services at, at 74 and... I guess contractual services. Like what makes those things up? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, about? I mean, I guess I'm wondering why why wouldn't it stay? The, why wouldn't we keep it the same as 2017? Well, and I I always look for potential increases that could cost with some of the benefit type stuff. Um, whether it happens or not, it might not. Um, so. We spent a little bit more in part-time wages than what I thought we'd spent. I'd budgeted for 35 because in 2016 we'd only spent 32,000, and we're, we actually ended up spending 42,000. So that was a $7,000 difference. So I budgeted for $3,000 more just to give a little wiggle room. One of the things about the pool, when we had it contracted out, we paid a flat rate to Dayton Pool Management no matter what was worked. Mm -hmm. So if we have a really hot, good season, which we did this year, right. um, we're going to pay more staffing. If we have a really wet, cold season, we're not going to have the pool staffed, so we would see cost savings because we wouldn't be paying those folks to be there. Versus Dayton Pool Management, we pay them a flat rate whether it was sunny every day or it rained every day. And no matter how many days the pool actually seen you know, good open hours. So the pool is a really hard thing to budget when you've got it in-house because if we have great weather, it costs us more to operate. If we have bad weather, it costs us less to operate. So it's kind of one of those things that's kind of difficult to budget. Okay. So I do my best. Did you have a question, Judith? Well, it's not directly related to this. It's just the pool. Um, you know, a loved institution. I'm just wondering, you know, looking forward, say, the next five years or not too far ahead, but, I mean, is this physical... Uh, how is it doing? Is it that would be a Jason question. Jason question. Jason, can you? I mean, it seems like uh, a lot of positive, uh, good things come with the pool in terms of what children and families uh, enjoy there. And um, so I just, so yeah, what are you going to say? It's doing well. Is um, it? Okay. Yeah, Sam and, and the Life Girls did a, a fantastic job this, this year. Um, we had a little bit higher. Um, cost of maintenance of facilities just okay. because it's an older pool yeah. and some of the stuff that we had Dayton pool management do they kind of let it fall through the cracks so we were kind of picking up the slack with it but uh, as far as budgeting for uh, concessions as far as um, you know doing group things for the kids as far as everything else Sam has a really good hold on that and and, and I mean I, I think it, it ran and the basic fabulous. maintenance seems to be holding it steady yeah yeah, and I, right now we've got all of our filters relined, so we won't have to do that. Our pumps been rebuilt last year, we won't have to do that. So it's just shutting everything down, hoping that we don't have a bitterly cold winter, and picking up right again next year and, and running with it. So, so there was a point in time where there, the the prevailing opinion was that we were going to need to replace that pool in the relatively near future. Is would you say that? that we can get along for a while without 
even thinking about that? Yeah, I think that uh, right now, I think that the, the inner workings of the pool, um, we've upgraded some stuff, and I think it's going to extend the life a little bit. Um, the foundation of the pool will be the biggest question, um, and we'll have to do that because, it, you know, as you all know, it's built on a junkyard, and, and some of it's settling and whatever. So um, there are going to be some cracks and crevices need to be filled in, but for the most part, I think we the inner workings are, are really good. So, so it's just maintainable. It's you just, just maintainable. have to you just have to keep yep. doing the maintenance yes, on it. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Cool. And we're not gonna have a super slide apparently. <laughs> no. Or <All> high dive. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I, and I, I'm glad you mentioned about, uh, you know, Sam's good work because I saw the bump up in concessions and I know we worked on that yep. and uh, yep. it's good. Yeah. And the, the dog swim was... That was awesome. <laughs> See? I need to get a dog. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Bring your brother's dog. I know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Melissa? So, really, with special revenue funds, those are the two that have the most activity um, that are the most notable. The rest of them, as I said, um, we've got eight others. Um, the green space, I will, I will highlight the green space just briefly. Um, I did um, project that 50000 would be going into uh, the green space, so um, we would start out 2018 because of our expenditures this year with 153990 and then we would be adding 50000 to that, so that would be pushing us just slightly over 200000 by the end of 2018 with the green space. And as far as I know, we don't have any projects on the horizon unless uh, Tecumseh Land Trust comes with something since the um, commitment was made by council a few meetings ago to um, possibly put in what could be $50,000 a year if projects um, came up for them to uh, secure property around the green belt. So mm -hmm. that's that's pretty much it for special revenue funds and the police pension fund, like I said, it's pretty much clean in and out. Okay. A quick question on economic development fund. Mm -hmm. Do you feel pretty confident that that number is an unencumbered amount? Yes, that has had no um, activity for as long as I've been here. So in order to be encumbered, we would have to have a purchase order open for something um, where those funds would be dedicated to, and cool. it, there's been zero activity I, since I've been here. I think he probably meant um, more restricted by, from the, from the original, um, and, and I think we've kind of decided that's been so long ago that there is no way to trace it back or It determine. would be really, I mean, I've got very minimal information in my office about it, so trying to, to dredge up that kind of history would be pretty difficult. And then if the information is even 100% accurate would be another question. Right. I think we can... So I would say that the that's amount that's yes. in the fund is pretty much... Um, up to council to do with as they please as far as I know because Sounds the history great. is yeah, it's difficult great. to Thanks. trace. Thanks, Melissa. Well, let's have a, uh, yeah. a question. We, uh, there was talk about a possible prosecutor and a possible social worker. Where do I see that in the 2018? That would actually be, for, oh, we that would have been in the general fund okay. um, with the police department and since since we're still, I, since I don't really know how much it would cost and what the proposal is going to be, I didn't incorporate anything in there into the general fund. Now, if a decision would be made by the time the ordinance comes to council, which would be in two meetings, um, then I, I could incorporate it. Otherwise, it would be something that would just be a supplemental appropriation okay. in 2018 once we have firmer figures. Okay. I mean, but but Patty, it, don't you think you can put a number, I mean, you could put a quasi number on it? On the prosecutor or on the outreach? On both of them. Well, we're talking about the salary for the outreach worker at 2022, Brian, was it? Yeah. At 20 hours a week. Um, uh, and that would be a contract position. Um, so there would not be benefits. As far as the, the potential prosecutor position, I have actually not talked to anybody about that because. I wasn't really sure where that was going to go, and that would be something that I would need to talk to whomever is elected mayor. 
um, you know, I've had a couple people approach me and say um, that it could be done under a small retainer, which would obviously change if the yeah. volume of cases to mayor's court. Yeah, can't but the, the prosecutor would be working for the village, not for the mayor. So to me, that would be uh, that would I, be. Yeah, you know, I'm just you know. I like the idea of a retainer. I like the idea of those two positions not being employees and being contract positions. Yeah, right. yeah that's right. But the but the um, outreach coordinator is going to be within the police budget anyway, isn't it? Because as this a is going as a contractual mm -hmm. service. Yeah. But I'm saying yeah. uh, that person is replacing one of the police officer positions correct or a half well that's position. what we originally talked about yes. but um, i think that chief is going to present something a little different when he presents it to council and to make it a, a 20 hour a week contract person as opposed to a an employee position no in i understand that but i still had understood it would be within that the the budget that 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 was what we had originally talked about but i think chief is going to present something different and ask for it to be an additional 20 hour per week contract position as opposed to making it an officer or taking one of the officer's positions and using that for it. Is that correct, Chief? Correct. And he can he can present his yeah. let's case do that, that when we're talking about the general, general fund, fund again. So when we <coughs> next um, next meeting we'll have everything with any revision. So mm -hmm. that's the point where we can talk about some of those changes and incorporating those with making changes to the PD and the mayor's court. So special revenue funds, um, that would be it for those. Capital project and debt service funds, um, that was at everybody's table. Um, this is real easy because it's got pretty much no activity to it. Um, all of these funds that you see are just showing the transfers in from the other funds. Um, there's only one fund that shows an expenditure and it will be on the capital uh, budget list which we will get to here in just a few moments. But that was the cable television capital improvement on the first page. The only reason I went ahead and incorporated this in was because this has been in process for quite a while. This is the third phase, the third and final phase of the, ca of the cable television improvements. And this would be the uh, improvement that would allow us to live stream, correct, Patty? That's correct. So I've, since we've spent, um, there was $10,550 that had been sitting in that fund forever that was finally used this year. So I've got $26,000 from the general fund coming in and pretty much coming right back out for that uh, third phase improvement. And the reason why I just moved it there is because it's cleaner to put it there and then that money will sit there and be allocated towards that project in case there's any kind of a hang up and it would need to roll it in the next year. So these are just all, the rest of these funds are all transfers in from the other funds um, in an effort to kind of build up those capital improvement funds, which we have not um, until 2016, which is great. Um, I have a question. What, what change will live streaming mean? Will people actually be able to hear and see council meetings? Is that what it'll mean? Mm -hmm. And they won't have to wait for a couple days to do that, do that? And they won't have to have cable to watch it live? Oh, how will they watch it? On the computer. Oh. On the internet? Yeah. Or? Ideally through our website, but, yeah. Hmm. Okay. So what about the folks that don't have internet? Well, then they watch it on TV. Well. How? I mean, are we going to, are we going to have both? I'm just, just asking. Yes. Okay. It's that's it. Until we lose our cable franchise, we'll have both. But okay. currently, people who watch it on cable can't hear. That's, that's still the case, I think, isn't it? Or at least all the people I know. Well, yes. It's not everybody. It's just, just like my friends. <laughs> my, friends. <laughs> my husband. <laughs> um, okay. And... And then and there's nothing. Excuse me. There's there's. I don't think that can be resolved. I think that that's a, that's an issue with Time Warner, Spectrum, and the, the equipment. I think it's it's an issue that cannot be resolved by Channel Five personnel. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good to, as a reminder, related to cable, is that we currently are what getting just above forty thousand a year, Melissa. 
Um, I believe so. Yeah, I think it's it's right around that mark. Okay. That was in the general fund revenues. Right, because we always just put it in the general fund. Yep. Um, but we're not overspending no. our, cap our cable franchise. Yeah. Mm -mm. So that's capital project and debt service funds. So now the fun part is the enterprise funds, and then we'll do capital and we'll be done. So um, if we take a look at enterprise funds, there was one um, change. The thing about these giant spreadsheets is whenever I add a line or delete a line, I have to make sure that my formulas are correct. And with the water fund, I added a line in and it didn't capture originally in what was in the online packet. So the um, copy that's in front of everybody has uh, yellow where the change was made. And it was just strictly on the expenditure side, even though I think that I highlighted the whole thing. Um, so enterprise funds. The front page is the Reader's Digest version, which I'm going to go over. Um, there are four major funds that make up our enterprise funds. These funds are meant to be self-sustaining, so they don't get any help from the general fund whatsoever. Um, we've been in dire straits at points where the water fund had needed a little bit of help um, at the beginning of the water plant. Um, process, which you'll see if you look at 2015 revenues for water fund, you'll see a really high number and that's um, strictly because of a general fund transfer in to offset the cost of the initial engineering with the plant. But these funds are all meant to be self-sustaining, so their um, consumer fees are meant to cover their expenditures um, with no help from any other fund. Um, so. We've got electric, water, sewer, and our solid waste. I'm going to go ahead and tick the solid waste off of the list here because it's the easiest. We have pretty much one source of revenue that's um, the consumer fees, and then we have some very small things such as our, our stickers and our trash bags that we sell, which are minimal. And then um, we have our expenditures, which is our contract with Rumpke. So we try to keep those uh, figures, our revenues, um, in line with what we expect to uh, spend and then have a little bit that possibly goes into our reserves just in case we need it. So um, in 2017, our revenues were set to be slightly higher than what I projected and then our expenses were also just slightly higher by $4,000. So this is the whole reason why I always have a supplemental appropriation at the end of the year is to kind of clean up some of these loose ends. but. Solid waste, we don't really see any major changes because that contract um, was just renewed, so there aren't any changes to our rate structure or anything like that. So solid waste is fairly easy, and I expect it to be in the black by $2,300, but hopefully we'll have a little bit of, uh, a little bit of uh, buffer that builds in, um, as it did this year, a little bit more than what I thought that we were going to have. So we will start with the electric fund. Um, the electric fund, Johnny and I have talked at length, and then Patty and I as well. The electric fund is a very tricky fund in which to predict because basically our revenues are directly driven by our expenses. And the reason why that is is because if our power costs increase for whatever reason, which if you look at our 2017 budget versus our projected, we're projected to spend um, a little bit more um, to the tune of about $70,000 than what we did, what I budgeted for. However, if you look at the revenue side of that, we're about $300,000 higher, um, a little bit less than that, than what I pro projected. So. Whenever our expenses go up as a result of our power costs, our revenues go up as well because we've got a power cost adjustment that is added into our rates. Um, we had a 15% increase and a rate structure change in 2017, which made it very hard to predict because our rates weren't really in line, um, as everybody may remember. Our, our rates were, our rate structure was really old and the more power you use, the more of a break you got and so we changed it to a flat rate structure so that the larger power users um, weren't being um, rewarded for being larger power users. We were kind of putting more of an emphasis on um, conservation by giving everybody a flat rate. 
so it was kind of hard to predict what was going to happen and then as a result of that our rates becoming more in line with um, what they should be our power cost um, adder was minimized whereas our power cost could be about four or five cents every single month um, which kind of varied depending on how much power we were selling now it's closer to like a penny um, if not less than a penny so when our expenses go up, our revenues do go up, but um, it, it's a very hard thing to predict because we've also have, um, we also have these different hydro plants that have been coming online, which directly affect our power costs. Um, we're going to have the solar that comes online. It's a really tricky animal in which to predict. So basically, I have to just keep a really close watch on electric, um, but it's still the healthiest of all of our enterprise funds. Um, if we look at 2017, um, we're set to bring in uh, $255,000 uh, more in revenue than our expenses. So with that being said, kind of like the increase that we've seen in our general fund, um, I would like to suggest that with our um, our next supplemental appropriations that we possibly move a hundred thousand dollars of that into our capital improvement fund for 2017 so that we've got some of that extra money dedicated to any capital improvements that we would need if council would be agreeable to that capital improvements for the electric fund. for for the electric uh, infrastructure yes for, for 2018 right? for 2017 taking some of that increased revenue um, and that we that we're seeing in 2017 and at the end of the year when I do the supplemental appropriations go ahead and move that into the capital improvement fund oh, okay and I'm actually going to suggest that we do that with uh, water and sewer as well. Um, if everybody remembers, we have not been doing this before 2016. So our capital improvement funds, when it comes to our uh, enterprise funds, they're pretty much you know, minimal or non-existent in terms. I, we haven't moved anything into the water um, because we weren't really in a position to do so. so Building those up is really important because it really shows the village's commitment to uh, to putting money into our uh, improvement of our systems and our utilities. And I think that if we see any increase in our reserves at the end of any year, that we should probably make that a common practice of at least dedicating a portion of that to our capital improvement budgets or funds, I should say. So if we look at 2018 for electric, I'm doing the best that I can with this one. Um, I think that our our revenues could stay steady. They might take a jump up if we see um, an increase in our expenses and our power cost adjustment um, makes us bring in a little bit more revenue. Um, the expenses, it's tricky. I talked to Johnny quite a bit and Patty as well about this. With these hydro projects and the solar and everything, it's hard to tell where our expenses are going to land, so I, I'm doing the best that I can again. Um, I think that we'll be in the black, but by how much, I'm not sure. Um, at this point, I'm pre predicting uh, 39000 um, and our reserves are you know, in, in great shape, and we're still continuing to add to our capital improvement fund with electric. So. That's electric. Okay. It's a very tricky animal. What are the capital improvements that we're saving for? Um, well, that would be a Johnny question. We have not done, I, I think that Johnny can speak to this, um, doing improvements on the system have not been something that had been done consistently historically. That's correct. Until this year, and some of the uh, funds went for the solar field. Uh, mm -hmm. Looking forward, uh, probably doing some major uh, line upgrading and maybe taking some of it from overhead to underground. That would be projects moving forward. And, and the station, transformer station, don't you need to upgrade? I, I do need to do some maintenance and uh, some repair work to the uh, switching station as well. What about the poles? <clears throat> the poles, we're, we're tackling them. I've, ha I've actually got it in the budget for a certain amount of poles every year so but that's an ongoing, that's an ongoing number thing. that you put in there uh, we're trying to get like patty just said we're trying to get uh, a bypass circuit for uh Dayton power and light to be able to install for the switch station to where we could bypass ours temporarily to where we can get in there do work safely mm -hmm. uh -huh. and then bring it back online 
so just in case we have a problem like we have in the past twice now that we could hit a bypass and it would bypass the whole uh -huh. switch station. Are there particular areas where you're thinking about burying lines? Um, probably, I, I would hate to guess right off the bat, but a lot of the back right of ways that we're having issues with. Okay. So. Like the alleyways? Well, I know. It, it would have to be a major undertaking with yeah. all the utilities. And there are some problems like down in um, along President and Rice Road Correct. through backyards where there are a lot of problems with older trees that are Correct. causing outages. And Thanks, Tony. How do we figure out what we actually, how much money we need for infrastructure? <coughs> there. No, but I guess I'm saying, you know, we've got this very healthy fund and I'm sure there's always improvements one could make, but how do you decide if it's necessary or not? Well, I think the first thing to remember about the electric is it, $2 million looks like it's really healthy, but what we spend in power costs alone that we have to plan for, that's, it, I know it sounds self-serving, but that's not a lot in, in mm -mm. the electric fund. And I mean, there are, there are some things that Johnny can estimate like um, if he's going to replace X number of poles every year how, and how much they cost and extrapolate that. Um, he, can, he can tell you how much the DPNL switch is going to cost. The other things, they, you know, like burying under, underground, that's a major undertaking. Right, we would have to get with AMP and have an engineered estimate to be able to even think about it. <clears throat> but is there some kind of a plan like this is our plan in the next, this is, you know, first priority, second. I guess that's what I'm asking. And like, is there, I, some, I is there some way for us to know, given the size of our infrastructure, our electric infrastructure, what a reasonable amount you would want to be having to be able to set aside for yeah, improvements? I, I, I don't know. I just. Until we looked at the village as a whole, I couldn't answer that. Yeah. yeah. I will say, though, that. I, I work with Johnny very closely, and one of the sticky parts of this whole thing is Johnny's in charge of electric distribution and water distribution, and we all know what water distribution has turned into in terms of a job for him. So trying to plan what can be replaced when is very difficult when you have another utility that's just as um, urgently needing attention as what electric might be yeah I just wondered how you do it I don't know but it sounds like it's not that easy well it's yeah e actually each of these three gentlemen sitting here would have to work on a and and should be working on a capital improvement plan that prioritizes that list but that's kind of what we do in the capital budget mm -hmm. at the same time they tell us what they're planning on in the next few years you'll see that Brad has rehabbing the water towers in there um, I, I think and a truck and Johnny has his projects and Jason has his needs. We should have a five-year capital. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what we have. Yeah, yeah it's, have. it's in the budget to look at tonight. But okay. on the flip side of that, though, we haven't been dedicating money towards those capital improvement funds because all of our enterprise funds were so stressed because they didn't have enough money to basically operate. Right. Um, until we did all of our rate increases. Right. So they're just now, we just started moving money into them last year. So it, they really haven't had a whole lot of time to start thinking about really big projects yeah. and plans to do with that money because some of them don't really have very much money in them at right. all. So we went from a maintaining to looking forward to mm -hmm. seeing what uh -huh. we could do better. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the water fund. So this is, a, this is everybody's favorite. Um, so the water fund, this one is, is also kind of a tricky one. Um, if we take a look at what I budgeted for in 2017 and what's projected, um, revenues are just slightly down by approximately $30,000. Um, Brad did put in a new meter out at the water plant and um, Brad has been submitting output numbers. I have all the numbers, all the figures um, in terms of 
thousands of gallons that are being billed so that we can try to calculate water loss. And um, once we got a couple more months worth of um, figures under our belt, we were going to really start to dig in to try to figure out really accurate water loss numbers um, so that we can I mean, we've got really hard numbers from what Brad's putting out at the plant and what I'm billing out. So um, Brad and Johnny and I, um, at the end of the year, once we've got better numbers, we're going to really dig into water and, and take a look. Even though it's, an, it's only a $30,000 gap, um, we really want to try to get a good handle on that. So um, we, it's something that we are definitely watching um, very closely. Um, we have one more year of a 30% increase, so I've got our 2018 budget based off of our 2017 projections in terms of our revenues. Our expenditures in water are very modest. You do see an increase there, however, the, very, um, the water plant will have uh, semi-annual payments. Um, the, the loans that we have um, come out the 1st of January, which actually come out at the very end of December. Um, they're very uh, tricky that way. And then uh, the second payment comes out at the end of June, which is considered their July 1st. Um, so our first water plant payment, I am anticipating that to come out uh, mid-year. And although the amortization schedules have not yet been published because not all of the draws have been made um, to, to pay for the water plant, um, based on everything that I know, um, our, first, our first year's payment, which would be a half payment, is estimated to be about 175000 So. In 2017, our original budget was 829,000, and in 2018, I've got it at 922. So that's less than a hundred thousand dollar increase, and that's bracing for a hundred seventy-five thousand dollar payment. So, I sat Johnny and Brad down, and I gave them the very stern: "You're not allowed to spend any money until we know exactly what this water plant's going to cost." <laughs> so. Um, Thankfully, Brad has a water treatment plant that's in great shape. Um, the the new the new water plant's going to be coming online, so um, he's not going to have some of the maintenance costs that he had before. Um, everything will be under a warranty as of October. Is that correct, Brad, or was it September uh, of 18? Yeah. So everything will be under warranty for the most part. There was one thing that Brad did not have um, by the time I had to have this budget in, which was some of the chemical costs. Mm -hmm. So um, when, when, we, when we come back around to uh, look at the budget uh, next week with all the final revisions, we'll see uh, a little bit of an increase in water um, because of those chemical costs that Brad got some better figures from last minute. So all in all, um, at the end of 2017, I've got us adding $270,000 to reserves and at the end of 2018 adding $301,000 to reserves. That all sounds great, and um, I feel pretty good about everything as it, as it relates to water. Um, I'm just really waiting to make sure what our final payment is going to be so that I can, I can move forward with uh, planning. But since, since things are looking uh, pretty good uh, in 2017, I would also recommend with the final year uh, supplemental appropriation that we move $50,000 into uh, the capital improvement fund, which we have not moved anything into that fund from the water fund yet. Um, so that would be my recommendation for the end of the year for water. So does anybody have any questions about water? No? Okay. So sewer fund, um, we've got um, ex or we've got revenues that came that I'm projecting to come in about five thousand dollars above what I budgeted, which I never come that close. So that's really really interesting. Um, and our expenditures are about fifty thousand dollars lower than what was projected. So at the beginning of the year, I was expecting to add eighty-three thousand dollars to reserves, and um, in twenty seventeen, at the end of the year, we should be adding about one hundred thirty-four thousand to reserves. So with that being said, I would like to also recommend that we move fifty thousand to the capital improvement fund from there. It would still leave our reserves um, well Wait. above the recommended minimum. Here in sewer. Mm -hmm. Yes, sewer. Okay. in sewer. And then in 2018, we've got a, uh, another 15% increase with sewer, and I believe that this is the final increase for sewer. 
So our revenues would reflect that based on what happened in 2017 and our expenditures are just slightly up from um, what was uh, budgeted for 2017 by approximately $14,000. I think it's the final 15% increase, but not the final. No, it's not the final increase, the final larger increase. I guess I should correct that. And, and my recollection was that all of those increase uh, pieces of legislation said that after five years, that or after this, that there would be periodic or there would be yeah, step payments. Yeah, they were going to be minimal. Mm -hmm. um, I know, I think with water it was 2.25 and then um, with sewer I think it was 3%. Mm -hmm. okay. I have a little cheat sheet that's yeah. in my office that I should have brought with me and I totally didn't. <clears throat> so sewer, sewer is looking pretty good in terms of um, in terms of reserve balances as well. So that's um, enterprise fund. So everything's in the black um, for 2018 and we will end 2017 in the black as well with all of those funds. Even if we move the money out from, uh, from those enterprise funds into the capital uh, improvement funds. Mm -hmm. Final piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna need a drink of water. Okay, so we've got our capital budget for 2018. Um, I've got this broken down into funds. It's all color coded because if you know anything about me, I love to color code. Um, general fund, the only thing that we have in 2018 is the PD needed a couple of new computers um, to the tune of $8,000. I should back up and say that any of these figures that you see in this budget have not yet been incorporated into the budgets that have been presented to council. I like for council to look at uh, just pure operating costs when I present the budget and then these things um, could be seen as more discretionary, even though they're needed. Melissa, can, can you tell us what page it's you're in? It's capital budget. budget. Yeah, it says capital budget. It's just capital budget. It's got projects listed on it. It doesn't have a state. It doesn't on say capital. Oh, yeah, it does say capital budget. Oh, okay. There we go. Thank you. And we're starting with the, um, with the front yeah. page, which starts with general fund in green. So Chief Carlson has requested a few <coughs> computers. Um, he also needs a few new mobile data, data terminals, which are those in-car computers, um, but that's not until 2019. Street Fund, um, the only thing that we've got earmarked for 2018 is uh, sidewalk domes, the MVRPC grant that I talked about earlier. That's our portion of the match for that, um, which is 33,750 that would be next year. And then um, Jason did earmark a field truck with plow in streets, and then the other half of that uh, should be in sewer. In sewer yeah. Yes. And then um, we've got our capital um, capital project funds. We've got the third phase of the cable improvements in 2018, which we talked about earlier. Um, in sewer, we have the OPWC Winter Street grant portion, um, which Patty had me include, so she would know more about that if anybody had questions. Um, electric Capital Improvement Fund, that's all pole replacement um, that we talked about earlier, uh, $75,000 a year. And Facilities Capital Improvement Fund, um, Chief Carlson has requested a remodel of dispatch in PD as well as a dispatch console replacement and that total actually did not um, did not include all of it so that would be sixty thousand dollars total and if you have any questions about any of these individual projects or pieces yes. of equipment um, i'd like to know about the dispatch what's involved uh we, we'd like to create the area to be compliant it's not currently um, so we're bringing people in. Those of you that have visited me know I bring you in the back door now around. So we need an enclosure inside. We'd like to make that window a little bit smaller um, at the front entrance when you come in. Um, Chief, also want to Chief when you, I'm sorry, when you say compliant, would you explain what you mean? You, would you come up to the, just yeah. the. Let's hit the. <coughs> The dispatch terminals and computers, um, civilians and uh, anyone that enters the PD cannot view those. Um, so that's one thing that we're doing to work with the Ohio Collaborative, um, and that's what I mean by compliant. The uh, 
we want to make the window a little bit smaller when people come up to a little more accessible, but a little uh, not quite as, as large. That will also help with security. Um, but most importantly, we want the counter space in the area the dispatchers work to be ergonomic. Um, right now it's a little uh, hard. They have to sit. Some of them bring their own equipment in. <laughs> And throughout the night, they'll place the computers upright and move things so they can stand up, sit down. So those are th some things that I was hoping to be able to do. Um, uh, basic aesthetics, I don't know if you've been down there. Our floor uh, down the hallway is coming up. It's actually separated from the concrete. So at this point, we've uh, requested that the custodian not use um, any water when he cleans that area because it's just making it worse. That's in the dispatch area? Well, that's in the hallway next to it, but okay, I was okay. planning on including that in there. Yeah, that's good. Okay. When are we going to discuss some of these changes? Is that the next time around? The, what do you mean? These, cap, these capital improvements. Um, well, I mean, if you have questions about the capital improvements, mm -hmm. we should talk about those now. Yeah, whatever council is agreeable to, I will incorporate into the next budget uh -huh. revision and discussion. I mean, I, I missed the last discussion. Um, I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm always for spending as little as possible, <laughs> quite honestly. <Me> <laughs> uh, and so... You know, I guess I just have questions about, you know, if we're talking about increasing, you know, you know, the necessity, I guess. I mean, what, what just why don't you be specific? I'm talking about, you know, this, you know, changing the dispatch area specifically. I, well, when um, I hear compliance with privacy and when I hear ergonomic well, and well, the ergonomic and, thing I think is very important. Um, I just know as a nurse, you know, I just know the setups we have and they're, you know, we, we are, we're required to keep privacy, but usually we're sitting in pretty open areas. Um, so I guess that's... Well, the, I can tell you that uh, LEADS, which is the Law Enforcement Automated Data System that they run on the computers along with the National uh, Crime Information Center, those two things are required by law um, to be not right. viewed by yes. civilians. And I don't think you can view anything yeah. from and, outside. And I think right. that right. When, when we had our audit, because they come in and audit you every year to see that you're compliant, I think that was one of their complaints, was that we were non-compliant and that those things were visible to anyone who could be walking through the dispatch area. Correct, Chief? Correct. We moved, if, in case you haven't noticed, when you come in now and you, and you look at the dispatch window, you'll see the backs of all the computers. Right. We moved those up to the screen because there was also a potential reflective issue. So if you're at the window, you could see things off the rear window. And uh, you know, we've kind of just been or organizing and, and making do um, with the setup. Um, so that's really what inspired all of this was mm -hmm. to get us to that point. Mm -hmm. if, and if you'd like to come down, I can kind of yeah. walk but, you through the whole but thing. But it's not cosmetics. It's, I, I heard, well. You know, it's, yeah. You know, we, we've improvised right. to, to, to hide stuff that shouldn't be seen. Well, I mean, I'm not going to, you know, hide the fact that if we do this, it'll look nicer. It um, should. But. I mean, my suggestion would be that you that you try to to do it as as economically as possible. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, I don't see how you cannot do what you are being required to do. Mm -hmm. well, we can certainly revisit and mm -hmm. fine tune. I'd be open for that. Well, I mean, you have to remember the other thing, too. If you allocate the money and he doesn't spend it, it just mm -hmm. gets freed back up. I mean, if they if they look at that and they can do the dispatch remodel for $30,000, as soon as he's done, that 15000 mm -hmm. is going to go back into the general fund because the, the PO is going to be closed out. So Well, shouldn't it well, stay in it, the capital fund? Yeah, funds? it would be in the capital fund. I mean, yeah, right. you can leave it there. But, I mean, it, it does, if it doesn't get spent, it's still available is right. what I'm saying. 
for something else. Um, so just in the essence of time, from 2019 out to 22, I'll, I'll let council review that on their own. Um, if we turn this over and we look oh, at the Oh, one more thing. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, Johnny, how many polls do we get for 75,000 a year? As many as we can get done. And uh, what is that on average? Um, probably about 35. Okay. I mean, you. I mean, based upon the con the previous conversation we were having with you, Johnny, you might want to put some of these other projects for the next time this comes back. Some of the other projects you were mentioning, you might want to try to get onto this. Same same with all of you. If there are projects that you know that are coming up that you need to add, maybe make this budget a little bit more reflective of other things you'd like to do. Um, I have a comment about the police cruiser, which is not for 2018, but 2019. I, my, it's my understanding there are now electric, or at least um, semi-electric police vehicles. So I, if at all possible, I am strongly, strongly recommending that we do that if we get a new one that we do that I've, I've actually talked to all of the superintendents to look at um, electric or hybrid vehicles the next time that they do that there was a really interesting article in one of my public management magazines that I shared I think with all of you if not I still have it but I know that Johnny was looking at an electric water meter van a couple of years back. Yeah, and so they, they all know that that's the expectation is that if they can get what they need that, and have it be electric or even hybrid, then that's what we need to do. And I think there's even the opportunity for gas, natural gas power vehicles at some, in some instances, but I don't think any of you favor those specifically, right? So. I, mean, I do think we have a natural gas fueling station down at Dayton Yellow Springs and Trabine. But I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't know anything about the vehicles. I just know that a lot of major utilities and um, trucking companies are going to natural gas. And municipalities use them too. So what's that look about, Johnny, with natural gas? I've, I've had a buddy part up with one before. So oh. I, I, and he worked for the and he got rear ended and they punctured the gas tank. And, and it's. It's not a liquid, it's a vapor. Mm. So, okay. But they do make, the, the vehicles that you need, they make in electric, at least, I know. So. Okay. So electric fund, Johnny, has uh, two things, CT and PT regulatory, or regulator testing, and then a forklift. And then uh, there's nothing in water, because I stress that everybody <laughs> just hold off on that. So with that being said, um, the second half of 2018, sh um, because there were a lot of things in 20, 2018 that were earmarked for water that I asked uh, the, the superintendents to move to 2019. So once we have our water plant uh, payments firmed up and I, I have a chance to take a look at revenues after the first half of the year with that last, um, last larger increase, um, they may be coming to request uh, some of those capital projects be moved into 2018 if everything works out that way. Okay. Okay. So I do have to say I'm <coughs> confused. What's the difference between what's on the front page and what's on the second page? Different funds. Or, or I know, but why? The ca so we've got we've got electric sewer capital improvement, electric capital improvement. Mm -hmm. Then this then is we out turn of over and we say electric fund. But yeah, those but it's are, at the top it says capital budget. But it's yes. enterprise. Yeah, well. it's just it's it's some of the things that are coming out of the some of the things are coming out of the enterprise funds and some of them are actually coming out of the capital improvement funds. Uh, okay. It's uh, operating versus capital. Yes, the the back side okay. is uh, operating. Okay. Um, can I ask about uh, this GIS, Johnny? Is this what we talked about uh, a couple weeks ago? Um, so I, I don't know exactly all the parameters of this project, but I saw a very impressive presentation from LJB, um, and they uh, have specific GIS services for municipalities, and so I would recommend that we get a presentation from them. Didn't, to see we, what doing. didn't we have a, pre a 
Karen, didn't we, isn't there some public entity that does that sort of thing? Am, am um, I misremembering well, that we had some presentation that? Well, we had some county, of our stuff, GIS, didn't we? What, when we did the smoke testing, wasn't some of the smoke testing, wasn't that all GIS? Yeah, my sanitary all in GIS. Okay. GIS. And wasn't that through, wasn't that through, that, a, right? wasn't that through some kind of a through public, RCAP, RCAP that's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. We need to be able to have it here. Well, and that's what, that's what my understanding was from our discussion, and that's what LJB is facilitating now, is user-friendly, you can handle it yourself. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so they'll, they'll come out and show us what they've got, and then you can decide if it makes sense. And, and that, but that GIS will take care of, it's something that Denise will be able to access mm -hmm. that, that will be used for all of our departments, I assume. Correct. Okay. Correct. That LJB is uh, the architectural yeah, the engineering. Is that Johnny Smith? Yeah, engineering. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, it's, it, it seems like a really good solution and, and they're reasonable. Then, then wouldn't we want to spread that through all departments and not charge it to, to just the one? I'll then we'll want to knock out it done. Oh, you want to knock out it done? Okay. <laughs> you, Water right. and electrics, I'll then done. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. Karen, just to answer your question, since we didn't have money in those capital improvement funds, most of the, all of the capital stuff stayed within the operating funds. So until those capital improvement funds are built up, some of this is is stayed within the operating. The electric stuff could move over. So um, okay. it's just, yeah. I mean, I find it a little confusing. Yeah. I mean, to, to 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 be talking about basically ongoing maintenance yes. in the capital fund yes. is a little confusing. It's just a lot of this stuff had historically been in there. Like if we if we go down to the next item on the list, sewer relining, um, that's that's earmarked for every single year, which is part of operating really. Um, and then the very last uh, section is sewer treatment. Um, Brad had asked for a new pickup, and then he needed some concrete work done out at the water reclamation facility. So that's it for capital. Okay. A quick question about painting the water towers. Brad, what what are you contemplating? I mean, just a straight straight paint job or something more? Um, Brad, could no. you come up? No. <coughs> I really haven't gone that deep into it. What this will entail mostly is they drain one, sandblast the outside, inside, recoat the inside, and then I think this quote was to do the exact same paint job that's on the outside currently. Mm -hmm. But um, we could look into doing something else. I'm sure it wouldn't. Yeah. I hope we do. I, I, yeah, I, do I too. won't I, be around. I would rather but as well. I well, I'll be <laughs> in Yellow Springs, but I won't be making the decision. But I would certainly look at that as an opportunity for us to make a really interesting statement, artistic statement, a value yeah. statement on those water towers. Yeah. <laughs> So unless anybody else has any questions, that's it for me. Okay, thank you. The next presentation will be much more concise. If we want to talk about the contract, which is employee position right now, we don't want to work. Let's wait, okay. Um, okay, manager's report. Um, I would like to tell my staff you guys can go on home if you want. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Somebody um, must have been texting you. You came in just at the right time. Yes, yeah, somebody was. <laughs> because they were 10 minutes later than they were told to be here. Um, so um, the housing needs assessment we've already covered. Um, I would like to mention that uh, we have received another AMP award. Um, Zap brought it to us because he was at the conference and Johnny didn't get to go. Um, so we received an uh, honorable mention in system improvement for a remote read meter change out project. Uh, congratulations to the electric and utilities departments for working on this and I think Melissa probably wrote the I did. submittal so good job on that. Um, construction on the solar array is moving along. It should be complete by the second week of October, if not sooner, and I'm still trying to get a hold of Jerry DeBoer at AEP to find out about the ribbon cutting. Uh, the Dayton Yellow Springs construction is done. Judy, can we stick up some pictures real quick? Um, Johnny has provided us with some pictures. Oh, nice. Um, wow, we added an ocean. <laughs> yes. It's the new It's so amazing cool. what that detention pond looks yeah. like. It's the new Wow, the sarcasm is heavy in here. <laughs> 
Um, so uh, anyway, uh, that one is done. Majors Construction finished that up and did a great job. And um, I think Melissa has an update on the, the financial end of that in her report, so I will not say anything about that. But um, we'll get some. Yeah, those are Brad's water plant pictures. We'll get on to that in just a second. <laughs> um, looks like the bottom ones there, yeah. Okay, well this is the water plant, so we'll go to the water plant. Brad's provided us with um, some nice pictures of the water plant. That's one of our new uh, pellet filters, uh, pellet softening, uh, some of the uh, chemical tanks, and this is moving uh, along ahead of schedule. Melissa has created some informational items that are available on the Village website and Facebook pages, and she can go into more report, uh, more detailed about that during her report. Um, this, is, this is the CVE uh, infrastructure that Majors just finished along Dayton Yellow Springs Roads. As you can see, it's completely done, seated and strawed. Um, they did a great job on that, and we really appreciate the work that they did there. Um, so um, I'll go back to the water plant now. We did have a visit, a site visit from Linda Bailiff at OPWC, which is one of our funders, and she was very happy to see what we were doing out there. Um, so, and the new unidirectional flushing uh, plans for the hydrants and the water distribution system are completed and they're being submitted to the EPA for approval. Um, Sutton Farmhouse, don't forget the burn for the Sutton Farmhouse is scheduled for this Saturday uh, unless it rains, which I think it is predicted to do. Um, and the rain date for that would be October 21st. The Bryan Center will be shut down on October 28th. Uh, the center will be closed as we will be replacing the backup generator and there will only be emergency power in the building. Don't forget that you, Rumpke will pick up your yard waste the last Friday of each month. If the bags that you need to put that in are available in the utility office. Trick or treat will be October 31st from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, I would like to tell everyone that John Christensen, who is one of our uh, water and wastewater treatment operators has obtained his class two licenses in both of those things, both water and wastewater, which is really a big, big thing. Um, I would like to wish a happy early birthday to Clerk Kittner, <laughs> whose birthday is coming up. And I would also like to um, bring a discussion before council about the composition of the Utility Dispute Resolution Board and possibly tying that into the Board of Tax Appeals, making them one body. Um, Chris, Melissa, and I have been talking about this, and it's a concept that we think uh, will work, and we'd like to bring that before council in a future discussion. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. Melissa. Okay, I'll keep it brief because I've been talking all night. Um, safe routes to school, I already gave an update on that. That was in my report. The um, utility extension, I am playing phone tag with my representative from the Army Corps of Engineers, um, but I had submitted all the final invoices in order to get our reimbursement, so I'm working on that, but I don't have anything new to update. Um, the only other thing that I have, which wasn't in the written report, but I will give verbally, is our EPA materials. Um, that have been created. Um, there was a collaborative meeting with the EPA and village staff um, probably about a month ago now mm -hmm. and they wanted us to uh, develop a communications plan um, in order to notify the public of any changes when, as it comes to the bringing the new water plan online and um, just educational materials about our water and uh, the water that will be produced at the new plant and our distribution system. So I've been really working hard in all of my free time in between budget and everything else to create those materials and the EPA has vetted them and given their blessing. Um, so I've been uploading those to our website, putting them on uh, the Village's Facebook uh, page and um, Shook has um, um, uh, publication that will be mailed out to all of the residents um, that's an informational piece about the new water plant um, which we're going to be tweaking. I got the first draft of today. So um, lots of good information for the public in regards to the village's water. So mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Chief? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, just uh, so we're clear, look to me from the financials that um, we did stay under the amount for the grant for the utility extension is we that did. We that's did. awesome yep i think that it was two hundred and seventy-two thousand, and we were under by about 600 bucks 
Okay. <laughs> well, two, no, it was supposed to be two hundred sixty thousand dollars, and we were under by like six hundred bucks. Okay. But we were under. Yeah. We Good. did not go Good. over. Good. Right. Good. Chief. So, I'm. I guess I'm not really sure why I put my glasses on. I did not have a report. <laughs> Uh, you look very official. Thank you, and I have a book. I am pleased to say that we completed last week's CIT training hosted at Antioch Midwest. It was uh, it was great. Uh, Dennis Snipper and Dave Meister both completed the course. The only officer we have remaining to go through it is Mariah England, and she just returned from Virgin Islands uh, with National Guard. Mm -hmm. So she's back in service here, and we're kind of getting back into the swing of things this week. How many people were at that CIT training? 36. So it was regional? Uh, Clark County, Springfield, Green. Um, I think there were a couple of state patrolmen. And the NAMI group, the NAMI Clark Green? Yes. Madison did it? Great. Yeah, yeah it was great. And the facility over there is just amazing. Um, the fact that we get to use that, it's unbelievable. I do want to say a personal thank you to Melissa. She's been uh, really burning it with budget and helping me ramble through. Um, and I'm get, we're getting there. And I, she has a great way of uh, creating an understanding and simplicity to that understanding. So thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions? Nope. Thanks, Thanks Brian. Uh, Judy. Business as usual. When we get up to future agenda items, you can you can hate me then because I have a lot to add. <laughs> oh, I, well, I'm already looking at the 16th, and it's looking oh, you have pretty seen out of control. nothing yet because there's wow. More. Okay, because so we've got we've got the second reading of of four ordinances, and then you have all these guys. Uh, Reading will be done in all seven. Yeah. The outreach coordinator isn't that coming on? Well, yeah, because I'm not that fast. Mm -hmm. Oh, these That's are just a discussion mm -hmm. item. So, anyway, there's a yeah. honk load of, of legislation. A lot of it's oh. on the consent agenda, but not all of it is on the consent agenda. Denise still needs to get back with me because she's got a couple of things she wanted to put on for regular read. So, that, that'll get fleshed out a little bit, but. It's heavy. It's weighted in. in let's so okay. So we've got that legislation. We've got the quarterly financials, and this is the one where we're actually going to be discussing it, them, Melissa. Yes, which it could be very brief because basically we've just went through all the financials okay. as of the end of August. <laughs> so we did add John Bryan community the gallery resolution. What yeah. what legislation, Judy? Do you have additional to this? Just all of the all of the zoning code stuff. You you Part already got the lodging tax. Are you if you're looking up at the thing, I just ran it. it it's a whole it, honk load of stuff. Changing things from so there's your appendix B that you spoke about, and then to transient gas. So and I assume we'll have that the same two of us that we're recusing ourselves on the lodging tax are going to continue to recuse ourselves on this. It, it is no. Yes. I spoke with the Ethics Commission again, um, and the distinction this time is, is because this is for the zoning code, which impacts the entire village for anyone who wants to engage in the activity, rather than those who already are. It's considered to be a law of general, um, uh, for general overview for everyone in the village, so it doesn't impact the individuals, because anybody can engage in the, the uh, transient guest lodging. Um, so that fact alone would not necessarily cause one to recuse him or herself. I have a question. You know, we've talked about, and, and I, I, I don't think it's happening in this bits of legislation, but where we were going to talk about putting limitations on, on or regulating transient guest lodging. This is not that, is it? No. No. no, no. This is okay. this is to have the zoning code right. read to consistently, work, with, the consistently with the lodging yeah. tax, right. Right. right? So I guess my question is, when is that? When are we going to start trying to look at that? 
Well, my we thought was from, from the conversations that we had in, during this process is that we would have the zoning code be made to be consistent right. uh, and logically consistent with the lodging tax. We need some administrative code. In other words, there was going to be an FAQ right. uh, prepared so that uh, anyone engaged in the business would understand the process of how to register and, and then would uh, go and seek their conditional use permit <coughs> for the planning commission. And I think that there was a, a sense that staff needed to find out how many people are in going to engage in that type of business activity and then perhaps revisit that question first of the year. But I don't know. But do we, if you don't know how many people are engaged in it, how do you know that it needs to be regulated right. in a certain way? Well, I think there's evidence that whether it, that that's, that's not really that is not necessarily. Uh, I you know I would be interested I in mean, seeing that. I mean, th that may be, but I, but I thought in the context of this is that we thought that we that we wanted to see how the rollout would work out against some sense of what the numbers were, and then that was a topic that can count. I mean, next year's fine. Uh, I think early next year we do need to. Look so at just that. to clarify, what? What, if any, substantive issues are we talking about with the zoning for lodging tax? Well, we put in standards for the uh, Planning Commission to consider for the co when considering whether or not to grant or deny a conditional use permit. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the only one that, that may be taken out of the consent agenda for purposes of council discussion. Say that again. I'm sorry. That currently in the zoning code, yeah. There were no standards that right. the Planning Commission right. would, had to consider to determine right. whether or not to grant the permit. We drafted uh, for the zoning code standards that Planning Commission uh, could consider, and that may be a subject of council uh, discussion, but that's the only one of the ordinance that I think council might want to discuss. And I think that that's what um, Denise is, is considering uh, as well as part of the report that will be presented in the packet. Did I say that right, Judy? Yes. You, you said Because yeah. we had thought in some circumstances it would be permitted, correct? It, it's a, a permitted, permitted use yeah. subject to conditions. And again, I, I think that we're trying to balance uh, the interest. So for example, uh, uh, one can take into account the density of, in an area, whether or not there's an, an impact on, on affordable housing. That is, that is in there, and that's was discussed at Planning Commission and, and Council may want to take that up again as part of the consideration. So, okay, I won't, I won't okay. pursue it. Um, and, and those, because we've actually added quite a bit to this agenda, is it for the timing, do those have to happen at this next meeting or can they wait potentially till November 6th? We want to make sure that the code, that the ordinances take effect before January 1. Okay. Yeah. And so my recommendation was look, if we could get those on as quickly as, as we could. And you know, frankly, all I think what there's about six, but they they can be done with the consent agenda but, to save the one. But then on the on the six though, they won't be able to be. They'll have to be all heard individually, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. For the second reading. Yeah, okay. But I think only the one might might engender some public comment. But certainly others are simply just. Definitional changes. Okay. Uh, okay. Another thing for the agenda, Bowen is making. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I've got that Bowen kickoff. Um, a presentation, a proposal on outreach specialist. Bowen kickoff for the 16th. Yes. It just it's a kickoff. Um, water plant transition information that will be Melissa and and pro maybe Johnny and and um, Brad. Uh, revolving loan fund presentation and updating the nominating petition discussion. Is that, I mean, is what that is really that? something that we sure need that to, was. I mean, can that wait till 2018? Sure. Uh, two years ago, <laughs> we said we were going to do this. So but I do not, I what? don't want I it to sure wait. I wasn't sure what it was. It's, so we have our, we are the only municipality in Greene County that has our own form that requires people oh, to for the nom uh, for nominate for, yeah. um, so can we, and it's confusing the instructions uh, don't can we match put it, it on the on the November twentieth agenda where we have one thing and we will will have gotten through all of this legislation as long as it's as long as we 
discuss it and take action by the end of the year. Okay, let's put it on the November 20th. Um, and there are two other things that I think we need to discuss for the, before the end of the year. Um, one is this House Bill 179, Sanctuary Cities, whatever we want to label it as. Um, I know Brian's done some thinking about that, so I think we need to come back to that. And um, I would like Hattie to do an update on the leadership and communications training and some of the initiatives that um, have come out of that. At which meeting, Brian? Uh, I'm leaving it open because I know let's, we've got. Yeah, let's plan on not before November 20th. November, November 20th or after. Just to add in, the November 6th, either, you know, from JSTF. We've got the taser policy. Either taser yeah. policy or there's a possibility that the thing that would make sense to come up is this data report. So we'll just say so, JSTF. Uh, JSTF will have one or the other, depending on how um, our action. What we JSTF decided our action. Meeting, you know, okay. What we um, yeah. and then the but then November 6th, we'll also still have a ton of legislation. We'll have all of that all planning that legislation. Yeah. Okay. Um, looks good. Uh, motion to adjourn. I move. Second. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 aye.